let me welcome the 57 and growing as we speak uh, participants to the fall 2020 FPA plenary meeting. Uh, I'm Matt Franzak. I am um, uh, along with uh, my colleague and very good friend, Dr. Matthias Steiner, uh, co-chairs of the FPON. Sorry, I'm looking at emails and I, I cannot walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. So um, uh, I'm going to hand this over to Matthias without any further ado so that I can uh, I, I can follow up on on the, the email that I just got and, uh, and and let him get the show on the road. Matthias, over to you. Sure, sounds good. Also from my side, welcome to the Friends and Partners in Aviation Weather Fall meeting. And uh, as some of you may recall, we were supposed to have this in person here in Boulder, which obviously given the current pandemic situation did not pan out quite that well. But I felt like I needed to give you at least, at least a little bit of a flavor of fall colors here in Boulder. So that's why you have this photo there from the Flatirons, you know, which is kind of the view uh, in our backyard here. So just enjoy it and think you would be in Boulder with us here. Uh, in terms of the meeting, I said already this is virtual, and we had to spread it out over three days such that we can accommodate also participate across participation across four time zones. That's why we start at 11 uh, East Coast time and run till about three o'clock East Coast time uh, each day. And uh, we already touched base hmm. you know, at the meeting. It's yeah. interesting. I I, <laughs> I know I've seen stuff we could pull by airport code before, and I just never even thought that that wouldn't be some of them. Could everybody please mute themselves? That would be appreciated. Thank you. So here is the agenda for the next three days, and I really digested it to the bare bones. We have pretty much one major theme per day. Uh, and then an additional shorter segment at the end of the day. And so the focus today is really on winter weather aspects, and, and there will be different flavors of that talked about, and then followed by the industry weather price presentation. Tomorrow, the focus will be on emerging weather tools in the cockpit, followed by updates from various ongoing topics that we have, and that will be a shorter segment. And, and on Thursday, the, our major theme will be the pandemic situation and what the uh, implications are for the aviation industry, but also where are the opportunities uh, uh, once we come out of this. And at the end of Thursday's uh, FPA meeting, we will uh, talk about some FPA related updates. As a heads up, uh, two weeks later on October 28th, we will have the planning meeting where we talk about future uh, FPA meetings, particularly the spring meeting, but also a look ahead at the fall meeting and what are sort of the key topics that we want to uh, touch base on uh, during those meetings. And last but not least, uh, rules of engagement here, how we do that. Uh, we pretty much follow the format that we did last time in the spring meeting that uh, we will use the chat uh, feature as a means to submit questions or comments that you may have. And Dave Strand of MITRE Corporation is graciously monitoring the chat and at the appropriate time will bring up uh, your comments and questions. And in order to minimize uh, interference and be able to keep the speakers, uh, you know, keep the microphone open for the speakers really, so please mute your microphones. Also, it might be beneficial to maybe turn off your, uh, your videos to minimize the, the bandwidth usage that could be beneficial too. And if you have anything urgent that needs attention, please raise your hand in the virtual uh, world and Dave Strand or others may pick up on that so that uh, you can 
bring to our attention what what may need to be brought up. So with that, I really uh, don't want to use up more time up front here and rather hand it over to Josh Paros for his winter weather uh, session and he will give you a more detailed look at what we are talking about uh, today. So Josh, it's all, you, all yours. Thank you. All right. Hopefully you can see my screen here, folks. Um, Josh Paros, Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport. Um, so a day here focused on winter weather. Luckily, uh, so far in Minnesota, we haven't really experienced any winter weather. I have a nice fall going so far and hopefully everyone else is as well. Uh, it's only a matter of time though. It's inevitable, unfortunately. And then uh, my particular job will get busy along with a lot of yours probably. So today we're going to have uh, kind of four separate presentations. Uh, the format will include a question and answer format after each of the four. Um, and then as well after all four of them, we can certainly review the entire day as well. So first, uh, I want to introduce Stephanie DeVito. Stephanie was nice enough to fill in at the very last moment. Um, unfortunately, Matt Tucker had to uh, tie to bow out at the last minute. We really had quite a change in the uh, lineup for this for this session, um, rather short notice, but uh, very much appreciate Stephanie. I know she's on a time crunch this morning, so I want to let her go ahead and get started with an update on the ICICLE program. Stephanie, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Um, to try to turn my camera on here. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie DeVito. I know some of you that are on the call. Um, I will be going through the in cloud icing and large drop experiment, um, providing an update there. Some of you who've seen some of this information before um, may be revisiting some things you already know, but hopefully um, it'll be informative nonetheless. I'll go through a brief overview of the Icicle Flight campaign for those who are unfamiliar, and then I will go into talking about some updates we have for the program itself. So let me just go ahead and share my screen now. Um, here we go. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes, 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 yes we can, awesome. Steph. Thank you. <laughs> this is my first time presenting in uh, Microsoft Teams, so. All right, so ICICLE is a new FAA flight program. Um, we had participation by a number of different groups, um, including the National Research Council of Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, Leading Edge Atmospherics, and the National Center for Atmospheric Research. There were a number of other participants um, shown here, including Desert Research Institute, NOAA Earth System Research Laboratory, uh, NASA Langley Research Center, Meteo France, UK Met Office, the German Meteorological Office, and four universities that I'll touch on a little bit more later in the presentation. Um, ICICLE took place back in the winter of 2019 from January 27th through March 8th. Um, we flew the National Research Council of Canada's Convair 580 out of Rockford, Illinois. Um, Rockford, Illinois is at the center of all these beautifully colored lines. Uh, each line here represents one of the flight tracks during the flight campaign. Um, we had 120 flight hours with, 120, with 110 of them for research and a total of 26 research flights. Um, this light colored uh, white colored circle here represents our targeted domain, which is a 200 nautical mile radius around Rockford. And you can see for the most part, we stayed within that domain. Our objectives um, for the, from the scientific and technical perspective were to observe, document, and further characterize a variety of in-flight and surface level icing conditions, um, including the environmental parameters and particle size distributions for small drop icing, freezing drizzle, and freezing rain, transitions between those environments and non-icing environments, and synoptic mesoscale and local effects. We also wanted to assess the ability of operational data, icing tools, and products to diagnose and forecast those features. Um, the type of tools that we looked at were satellite, radar, surface-based observations, weather forecast models, the parameterizations within those models and ensemble approaches, as well as icing products um, that many of you should be familiar with, hopefully, uh, including the current icing product SIP and the forecast icing product FIP. But in addition to our scientific and technical objectives, we had sampling objectives that would help us meet those um, scientific and technical objectives. So this included 
our um, focus on collecting data in a wide variety of icing and non-icing conditions. We have small drop and large drop, as well as null icing environments. This chart here is the environments that we targeted. There's a row here called priority, and although um, it's listed as priority, these are not necessarily prioritized. Uh, priority has been actually changed to more so mean condition in this case. So we targeted envi uh, various environments for, with freezing drizzle, uh, freezing rain and ice pellets, glaciated conditions, and then smaller drop uh, conditions here in yellow. We also targeted some clear air um, environments to help get those non-icing environments as well. We had a desire to sample at all times of day. Uh, this graphic here, um, you can see that there is an observed peak in freezing drizzle and freezing rain near dawn. Um, we wanted to try and capture and straddle dawn for a number of reasons, this being one of them. We also wanted to sample the full vertical extent of clouds and the precipitation. This means going from the surface all the way up to cloud top and back through. We wanted to capture the subcloud layers. We wanted um, to capture the clear air um, layers that may exist between different cloud layers. Um, we also wanted to do uh, prolonged periods, multiple paths, multiple altitudes, and missed approaches were of uh, particular interest for the program. And of course, we wanted to collect pictures <laughs> of what we were seeing. Um, that included ice accretion, clouds outside of the aircraft, um, and in the vicinity of the icing environments we were sampling. So for the Convair, um, there's a lot more detail on here that I'm going to go into, but just know that the aircraft was heavily instrumented with everything from in situ microphysics measurements for liquid water content, drop size, and so on, to remote sensing instrumentation, including um, airborne uh, W and X band radar, a radiometer, and we also had instrumentation to measure, to measure aerosols. In addition to the aircraft collecting data, we also installed five surface sites um, across our domain. Those five sites are listed here. All five of the locations had a present weather sensor, an icing sensor, a distrometer, which measures uh, the particle sizes and concentrations, precipitation gauge uh, with the shield, and a state parameter sensor. At Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, down here, we also had a salometer. In addition, we had uh, supplemental soundings performed by four universities, including Valparaiso, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, Northern Illinois University, and Iowa, and Iowa State. Um, overall, we launched about 27 weather balloons, but we had some challenges with this simply because there's a helium shortage. <laughs> At least there was when we were deploying, so we had to be pretty conservative in when we were uh, launching weather balloons. There were also a number of collaborative tools um, that different folks kind of brought to the table uh, for this activity. I'm not going to go into detail with them, but I'll just highly, I'll touch on them at a high level. We had access to one minute scans from the GO-16 satellite over our flight domain. Um, we would make special requests for that. There were also some modifications to um, the NEXRAD radars um, across our domain, the ones in red had a modification that added an extra angle scan. We also had uh, satellite products from NASA Langley available to us, and we also had a high resolution um, one kilometer her nest over our domain that gave us cross sections and other kinds of uh, high resolution information. So after everything was said and done and we flew those flights and um, we all had a blast doing it, uh, we ended up achieving um, about 83 hours of actual sampling and conditions over the course of about five and a half weeks. 49 of those hours are actually in icing with more than 20 in small drop conditions, more than 20 in freezing drizzle, and about six in freezing rain. Um, we also captured freezing drizzle and freezing rain environments with the presence and without the presence of small drops. And we also um, show here on the right-hand side 
a chart showing you how many hours of within each category we captured um, from those conditions identified in the chart on the previous uh, few slides. So you can see our freezing drizzle environments here, freezing rain and ice pellets and so on. Um, you can see in some categories we undercaught um, and overcaught in others, but we don't, Mother Nature does what she wants, so um, we're happy with what we got. Uh, we wanted to collect data in a wide variety of icing and non-icing conditions, and as the previous slide just showed, we did. Um, and just here's some pictures of some of the different icing uh, pictures that we captured. Um, here in particular, you can see um, that on this particular flight, we flew through both clear and rime icing environments. Um, you have this layered look. There's another one down here that kind of looks like a cookie to me. but. <laughs> As far as the altitudes we covered, uh, we flew from the surface up to about 23,000 feet. We covered a good variety of temperature and liquid water contents and drop sizes, most notably for freezing drizzle and freezing rain. Um, we got down to negative 20 C with, um, while observing freezing drizzle and down to about negative 13 C for freezing rain, which is actually on the cold end of the spectrum for those environments. So we're happy to have captured that. We flew anywhere from 4.30 a.m. until 11.45 p.m. local time. Uh, typical duration was around four hours for the flight, but we had one flight and two flight days, so we could have some long days at times. And we flew a variety of patterns. So um, here's two images on the right-hand side that just shows the variety of uh, uh, patterns that we, that we used. Here we have a bunch of straight lines just going back and forth between particular points. Whereas in this flight, you can see we performed what's called as a lawn mower pattern where we're going back and forth across an area to traverse some of the clouds and the conditions. I don't know why these pictures are that way, but um, we also captured over about 100 deep vertical profiles with 48 missed approaches. And these were done during freezing drizzle, freezing rain, snow, uh, precipitation free, uh, in precipitation free environments as well as layered conditions and cleared skies. So not necessarily all of our missed approaches were in those conditions, but our vertical profiles did uh, cover those. And obviously photography, we have plenty of pictures to show. Um, just to kind of give everyone a little bit of an idea of what a daily day might look like. Um, this is our schedule for a single flight day. Uh, the a forecaster would get up as early as 1.30 in the morning to prepare for a 3 a.m. weather briefing. And we'd go through this whole process with off um, landing, having, having shifts for the forecasters, and then preparing for the next day or the next few days. We had to be very mindful of the schedule uh, day after day and even looking ahead because we needed to make sure we were following the rules for the pilots and making sure we weren't overtaxing them or um, breaking any rules from that perspective. So we were pretty strict with ourselves and what we could and couldn't do. And um, everyone worked really well together to make this happen. So very great for that, or very grateful for that. So now what? We did all these great flights. Um, what are we doing now? Well, um, the FAA's icicle research is focused on two different projects within the FAA. One is in-flight icing, or IFI, and that's led by Danny Sims. Um, I have his contact information here. And the other one is the terminal area icing weather information from NextGen, uh, also known as Taywin, um, for which I am the lead. So for the in-flight icing program, um, that goal is to enhance automated diagnostic and forecast capabilities, so SIP and FIP, uh, to address in-flight safety, icing safety hazards, and updated regulation and sort of, um, certification changes for Appendix C and Appendix O. On the right-hand side here, this is an image of the current icing product severity, just for reference. Um, IFI's goal or IFI's working to improve SIP and FIP by incorporating enhancements in weather models, satellites, and radar. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on a future slide. And they're looking to evolve from the current forecast of icing severity, such as that shown here, to Appendix C and O drop size information. And again, that'll be covered a little bit more detail on another slide. On the Tawin side of the spectrum, um, this project is 
obviously by its name focused on the terminal area. And our goal is to develop a capability for icing diagnosis and forecasting specifically within the terminal area with an emphasis on freezing drizzle and freezing rain identification. The terminal area uh, for this project is defined as a, as a 60 nautical mile radius centered around an airport going up to 12,000 feet. We have a reason for this and we can discuss it <laughs> offline or in questions if anyone has questions about that. But the idea behind this capability is that if there were ultimately, if there was an Appendix C cloud somewhere within the terminal area and an Appendix O cloud, um, this information can be provided so operators know where they um, have better and a better idea of what's going on within the terminal area. Uh, the diagnosis updates would be every 5 to 15 minutes with forecasts from 0 to 12 hours. And we'll be looking at high resolution grid spacing, so around one nautical mile uh, horizontally and less than 500 feet vertically. Currently, we're working on developing our first version of the capability and we're hoping to do a demonstration of that uh, next winter. So as far as the research across all of uh, the areas of, our, of, of the Tewin and IFI projects, there's a number of different areas that we're looking at. So this list is, is tries to be all inclusive, but there's certain things obviously uh, that may not have made it on here. But just to kind of highlight some of these, we're looking at um, particle size and type investigation, um, looking at how the surface conditions compare to the aloft conditions, particularly within the terminal area. And we're also looking at how we can better use the information coming from the salometers that are at many of the airports across the country um, to see how we can use the raw backscatter information to help identify whether or not conditions favorable for icing exist right above uh, that sensor since it's vertically pointing. Um, we're also doing, uh, have, we also have research going on with GO16 and 17, so the satellites, uh, looking at high resolution and icing environment detection, evaluating cloud properties, looking at the solar terminator and how we can improve our detection around uh, during those times of days when satellite data can be a little bit challenging. We're also looking at NEXRAD dual polarization capabilities and its ability to detect the presence of supercooled liquid water. We're also looking at hydrometeor classification and drop size. And there's also efforts to try to improve the quality control of the radar to better differentiate between what's ground clutter and what's light precipitation because some of the light precipitation right now gets filtered out when the ground clutter gets removed. And that could be, for, we saw that happen during Icicle, and um, that could be uh, impactful for what Taewood and IFI are working to gain from the radar information. We're also looking at satellite and radar feature tracking, so seeing if there's certain features that may be indicative of icing environments and seeing whether or not we can track those and incorporate that into our icing weather tools. Uh, looking at time lagged ensemble forecasts, uh, looking at the current forecast weather models and evaluating um, the output in terms of fields that matter for icing, such as the cloud phase, the drop diameter, maximum drop diameter, and the liquid water content. And then shifting more towards the actual uh, operational end of the spectrum, for uh, Taewin, we're working on that capability development. And from the in-flight icing perspective, um, they're evaluating new versions of SIP and FIP, and they're looking to apply their research results from SIP and FIP to the icing product Alaska. One thing in particular they're trying to do with SIP and FIP is, or one thing they're working on, is um, transitioning from the current uh, lower resolution weather model to a higher resolution weather model. And they're targeting SIP and FIP operational enhancements in 2023, with drop size output being a future enhancement. So with all of those activities going on in parallel to one another <laughs> across our two projects, um, a lot of those activities will be leveraging the data collected uh, during ICICLE. 
So we obviously need the icicle data in order to do that. Um, so the data processing for most of the data sets is nearly complete. That includes the aircraft data. All the other data sets have already been compiled, but the aircraft data that with the number of there was a lot of redundant sensors and all those need to be merged together and the best sensors, the best data needs to be teased out. So that is nearing its completion. We're expecting that to all be done by the end of this month. Um, we're also working on a handful of, of publications uh, from a larger program perspective. We're looking to complete an FAA technical document on the ICICLE Science and Operations Plan. Um, we're also looking to submit an AMS BAMS article at some point within the next few months. And in January 2020, there'll be some AMS presentations if anybody is participating in that. And of course, there's always other things going on. So that's why I have among others. Now, as far as our group meetings, uh, back in February, right before everything shut down, uh, we had our first workshop out in Colorado. And that was focused on data processing, where all of the uh, everybody that participated in the flight program participated in this meeting and provided updates on what they what they were going to be doing, what they were doing with, with respect to data processing. And then um, at the end of this month, we'll be having our second workshop, which will be a data update. Now that all the data sets have been submitted, they'll um, the different teams will let everybody know what they submitted, what the quality was, what are some nuances, and a whole slew of other information. We're looking to schedule a technical interchange meeting in December um, to help support the teams if they have any questions related to the data sets. Instead of everyone reaching out to each other individually, we thought it would be good to get all the questions together so everyone was able to be kept up to date. Um, since with the final data sets all being provided recently, we want to make sure that everybody has some time to use that data um, before, before we wait until late spring in 2021 for our third workshop. So the third workshop will be focused on the research aspect where each team will review the research they're doing with respect to the data sets and receive feedback from the group. So that's basically where, where we're at at this point again is we're working towards the second workshop which is this data update. Um, over the next year or so, um, now that we actually will have those finalized data sets, there will be much more to report on in terms of um, our findings and our analyses of our different weather tools and um, some of those activities you saw on the, previous, on the previous slide. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And um, I guess we're doing questions now, so we can open the floor for that if you'd like. All right. Uh, we had uh, one question from uh, Matthias, actually. To what extent has there been a dialogue between Taiwan and airport operations? Um, so we've had some one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with certain airports uh, to to try and talk about how this could work. But our goal, our our aim for the demonstration is to have that discussion. Um, with airport operations at that time. We'll be working with the Audi team within the FAA um, to pull in a variety of different potential users and impacted folks to really get everyone's perspective um, as we move forward. All right, and uh, let's say Garcia had a comment, it looks like uh, in addition to the GOES data, there's Polar Orbiter Cloud Ice products from uh, the uh, NOAA NASA JPSS sensors. Mm -hmm. uh, this becomes especially relevant at high altitudes such as Alaska where geostationary data loses quality and radars are scarce. Um, the so icing product Alaska um, does take into account some of those polar orbiting sab satellites for the CONUS. Um, we're not focusing on those at this time. We're focusing on GO-16 and 17. Um, at least for this from the Taywin perspective, because we're looking at such lower altitudes. But yeah, that information is definitely valuable where there's overlap in coverage. Hey, this is this is Randy Bass. I can I can comment on that as well. You're so ready. Uh, Thanks. The uh, we are in the process of signing a uh, contract vehicle or putting a contract vehicle in place with uh, 
the University of Wisconsin, um, which would get us to uh, actually working with NESDIS to get us to uh, uh, CIRA and SIMS and some of the other uh, groups that are uh, working a lot of the uh, JPSS um, sensor uh, research to uh, to do exactly that, uh, to uh, to exploit some of the things that they're doing there. Um, and we just uh, got some uh, funding to uh, uh, NASA Langley for uh, to uh, access some of the work that they're doing. So yes, we are we are definitely uh, looking at the uh, the JPSS sensors, uh, the VIRS data, and some others uh, to uh, to see what we can do not only in uh, Alaska but eventually in the CONUS as well. Uh, obviously, it won't be uh, uh, you know updated like it like the uh, GO stuff does, but uh, there's there's some uh, interesting work that they're doing that we'd like to exploit. All right, thanks, Randy. And um, there was one additional question here about. Um, let me see, uh, Stephanie said the terminal program would be implemented this winter. And there was a couple of questions about just making sure. Let me see. Well, Matt, why don't you, or, or Marilyn, uh, do you want to ask your uh, question directly? I'm not sure I'm catching exactly what it was that you and Matt were asking there. Right, so, thanks, Mar Dave. Um, Steph, you mentioned that the terminal uh, program would be implemented this winter, and I was wondering where. No, so um, it'll it's not necessarily being implemented. Uh, we're developing it over this next year, and next winter we'll do a demonstration, an internal demonstration, where we run it at five. Our goal, our aim right now, mm -hmm. is to run it at five airports um, within the Northeast. Uh, particular, particularly in the New York region and Burlington, Vermont, um, at some airports or at the Burlington, Vermont airport and airports around Syracuse, New York. Um, the goal would be to to run the capability at those locations and start pull and pull together questions and scenarios and things like that for us to really dive in and identify who the who the ideal user would be, where it fits within the decision making process, and how that gets handled. So, um, again, it would be an internal uh, activity, though. Thanks, Steph. You're welcome. All right, one uh, one more question just came in from uh, Robert Sultan, uh, Roger Sultan. Uh, what weather products uh, did the flight crew use? Hi, Roger. Right, uh, <laughs> yeah, what, what products did the uh, flight crew use to find the ice during the flight tests? And sure. did the products prove accurate? Sure. Um, it's nice to hear from you, Roger. I hope everything's well. Yeah, um, everything's so good. Nice talk. Nice great. to hear you. So, um, as I said, we had forecasters that were pulling together all the information. So, before, prior to the flight, we um, the forecaster would pull together a weather briefing, based and looking at a number of. The, the data sets that I that I mentioned here today and that many of you are familiar with examining radar satellite forecast information uh, surface observations looking looking ahead and so forth. Um, based on that they provide a weather briefing to the uh, to the executive committee we called it basically and that consisted of the project leads and some folks within the FAA folks from um, NRC and from Environment Canada. Um, what we found during the uh, throughout the flight campaign is that the weather, the weather, the, the, the weather data sets on their own, the weather tools on their own um, did fairly good at at identifying particular forecasts I'm speaking to here at letting us know um, that there may be something um, that, that will be that will be interested in. The challenge we found was the location and the exact timing. Now we had a handful of um, we rotated through different forecasters each week and these forecasters know icing. They know exactly what they're looking for and they understand the nuances in the data sets and the weather forecast and the models to know how to interpret that information and, and how to consider it moving forward. So there was a lot of discussion on a given day on whether or not to fly and if we did fly what we would expect to encounter and then we'd talk about how we were going to fly. Uh, during the flight, the pilots 
um, we were af we were asking the crew to fly in certain uh, to certain airports or certain uh, on certain patterns based off of what we were seeing in the weather products. So in the satellite data, in the surface observations, what we were gathering from our surface sensor sites, what other reported, um, what the radar is showing. And in a lot of cases, we were looking at um, raw data fields, not necessarily the products, at least in making our initial decisions, because our goal was to go where we thought the weather was, not where the products were necessarily saying the weather was. Um, so we, we tried to keep that in mind as we were making our requests to the aircraft. Now, the pilots would let us know when they were comfortable going somewhere and when they weren't. Um, we didn't run into too many situations like that. But yeah, we were using the, the information that's available. We were looking at SIP and FIP and keeping those products in mind and allowing those to guide us when necessary, but we weren't exactly looking to target anything that the products were specifically saying. We were really looking to just try to capture um, the icing environments as they existed. So I hope, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I think overall, did thanks. Um... As far as severity, like the, the forecast, the forecasters that you had, the experts who might call for light to moderate and during the test flights, were you, were, were you pretty much finding that or were they way off? So we didn't, we didn't target based off of light and moderate and intensities or severities from that perspective. We were targeting different drop sizes. So we were looking for small drop environments or freezing drizzle or freezing rain. But I will say that on days where we thought that we were going to get uh, freezing drizzle or freezing rain, we almost always did. It just depended on how much of that and how long did it last. So um, we were very pleased with what we got because one part of it, Mother Nature has to provide the weather, but we have to get the aircraft there because it's just one point observation, this aircraft flying through a cloud. So I think it goes to show that our forecasters and the weather products did a decent enough job to allow us to be able to get to the environments when they did exist. Okay, thanks. That sounds great. Yep. Mm -hmm. Must have been fun. Oh, it was <laughs> so, a lot of fun. I would, I would have enjoyed being on the airplane too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you would want to have you would have wanted to avoid the ones where they flew over uh, Lake Michigan in some cumulus clouds. Apparently, that wasn't too fun of an experience. <laughs> I was going to say, from a pilot standpoint, I think I uh, maybe is, I'd call it sporting, maybe, but that's uh, seeking out the ice is. Um, Something we're not used to doing, but anyway, that, that's great. Well, thanks, Stephanie. I don't see any more questions coming in, so I'll uh, turn it back over um, to, uh, to Joshua there. All right. Yes, Stephanie, thank you very much. That was interesting. Some great photos and uh, those flight conditions would be would be interesting. And I do look forward to some potential benefits for airport operators as well. And uh, even here at MSP, we're always happy to entertain that type of research if, if we can be of assistance in the future. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me. Hopefully this uh, was informative for everybody. And, and, and Josh, before you go over to Gordy, let, let me, this is Matt, let me express my very deep appreciation to Stephanie for, for, for not saying what she wanted to say or what she probably thought when I asked her on like last Friday if she could come in and 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 fill a gap here and and not only did she do it but she was very gracious about it so thank you Stephanie thank you Scott Landolt and thank you everybody else who may help put this together at the very very last minute you're welcome thank you Excellent. OK, so with that, we'll move on to our next presentation. And just for a little overview here, we'll, we'll have Gordy uh, go ahead and give his briefing, and then we'll probably take a short break after that. But uh, without further ado, uh, Mr. Gordy Rother is going to give us an update on, excuse me, on uh, the pilot reporting, um, uh, uh, excuse me, adding PIREPS to the, uh, uh, adding breaking action reports. Two pirates. I think I got that right. Go ahead, Gordy. Okay. I can't unmute. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, okay. Ah, oh, there it is. It was not showing unmute. 
All right. Uh, now I got an X in the share icon. Why won't it? Why won't it? Oh, there it goes. It's just a little slow. All right. Let me uh, get the presentation up. But uh, while I'm pulling this up, uh, just for a little bit of background, uh, I was on the uh, Tulpa Takeoff and Landing Performance Assessment uh, Committee that was formed after uh, the accident uh, at Chicago Midway, where I was on that team that evaluated that accident, that overrun. And um, during our numerous meetings that we had in the 18 months of developing the TELPA uh, runway condition assessment matrix, um, one of the things that uh, came pretty clear was the need to, to get a feedback, um, not only assess the runway, and that's what the airports are doing, is assess the runway under standards, um, but but get the pilot feedback. And, and with the air traffic control towers, they've been providing that feedback, but um, unfortunately it's, um, it's timeliness uh, can be kind of a challenge. So um, let me just uh, shut up and start presenting here. But um, what we're looking at uh, is inclusion of uh, breaking action reports in the PIREP. Now you'll probably have seen in current PIREPs where uh, breaking action information was kind of tossed in uh, to the remarks section. Uh, there's no standard set, set up, it's just free format text. Um, it, uh, quite often it uh, leads to a lot of uh, second guessing because uh, uh, they'll use acronyms or terms or, or words in there that, that does not directly correlate to the way a pilot assesses the runway with today's um, RCAMs. So, We've, uh, there's been numerous overruns and excursions. Um, we haven't solved that. Uh, we've gotten better, but obviously we haven't solved that issue because we still we still see it around the world. Um, the current tools do not provide for a specific field. Uh, we looked at doing a specific field. That's still not out of the question, but one of the things we thought of uh, was, well, let's let's try to fix the let's try to fix the AWC's uh, portion here. So uh, we went to Aviation Weather Center, looked at their submission tool, and and to see if they could uh, format it, format the remarks section and, and put some kind of rules in there where you would, it would uh, utilize the RCAM uh, as guidance uh, so you couldn't put your own terms in. Um, you know, it, it would allow for the pilot to do an actual visual assessment of the runway uh, for uh, locations that, that don't have an airport authority, um, kind of focusing our look, look there on Alaska and some of the uh, operations that are conducted up there. So still have a pilot report, but um, uh, allow them to assess the uh, contaminant type and depth. Um, so um, we, we looked at that. And the we realized recently that uh, you know just changing the AWC's um, pilot re pilot report tool doesn't really fix the whole system. So um, we're going to propose that we make a, a broader change uh, so it so it affects all PIREPs. Uh, but that's the direction we're headed. Uh, we're expected to provide the the pilot. Um, well, this is the reason we're doing this is that um, is uh, that information is, is missing uh, when a pilot does a landing performance assessment. Um, so if you go back to the um, the guidance that was written um, in 2006 and then updated in 2019, uh, there's a discussion in the, the guidance on reliable braking action reports. And basically it's the those pilot reports that are intended to augment the field condition report. So when Josh's crew at Minneapolis goes out and does a field field condition uh, report, they go out and they, they do the assessment of the runway. Um, that's got a timestamp on it. So, that, you know, they'll say runway 30 left and they'll provide the codes for the runway. Uh, and, and that is done at X time. Well, we continue to land airplanes. We can't have them going out every landing. So when you have changing conditions, it's critical to get that pilot feedback information as far as how the runways are trending and to get that in a timely manner. Um, the FICONs are provided in... Um, Gordy? Oh, yep, go ahead. 
I'm I'm sorry. This is Matt. Uh, we're we're having a very peculiar issue where some people can see your slides and some people can't. Um, so so can I can I share them and we do this the old fashioned next slide, please, Matt, and sure. see if that fixes things for people. E either that or I might suggest uh, if Gordy, you have your video turned on. Okay, and turn it off. I've got two computers. One I see you, the other one I see your slide. So if you turn your video off, okay. I'm wondering if that won't solve see the if problem. That fixes it. Turn my mug off and see if everybody can see everything. Uh, no, now I see your slides on one. I see the big GR logo on the other. So <laughs> sorry. Back to you, Matt. What was your suggestion? <laughs> Okay, well, I, I was going to uh, share Gordy's slides from uh, from from my location. Should if, I stop I, presenting then? Yes, sir. Is that okay, Gordy? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, okay. I'll stop presenting. And by one second, I gotta now I gotta find them. Keep talking, Gordy. Keep dancing. Keep dancing. <laughs> All right. So that no crap, there I was. Um, <laughs> so uh, the. Um, back to the pilot report so when when in the guidance when we drafted the guidance uh for uh there's runway condition assessment makes matrix and how it's done it's recommended that pilots do the runway assessment prior to top of descent and at that time you're uh the pilots are generally generally with uh, the inner center and that center controller doesn't doesn't have any earthly idea what the braking action is at the destination airport so that critical feedback piece now that they're going to have the pilots are going to have through their dispatcher or or through access and a cars they're going to have access to the notams um and they'll have uh, information on the atis that that uh breaking action advisories are in effect so they'll know the runway conditions are uh, going to require a landing performance assessment but um yeah is that where that where we are yeah Am I in the right place, Gordy? I, I, I just took a gift. Uh, yep, exactly. You're in the right spot. Okay. So the, the pilots need this information earlier. And, you know, with with uh, if they're going into an airport where the tower is closed and, and now we've been experiencing due to, to COVID-19, you'll hear more about this, I guess, on Thursday. But uh, 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 tower hours of operations have reduced. Uh, so you're probably going to see that a little bit more at some uh, uh, lower traffic level airports where you don't have a controller and the, the pilots are going to have to rely on getting the information um, from their dispatcher or, uh, you know, they're going to have to get it uh, from somewhere. And, and that's the challenge we're faced with, not having it in, in a pilot report so pilots can access that data. With today's technology, a lot of pilots have electronic flight bags. Uh, that information would be available in the cockpit. So what we're, what we're looking to do is, is format the, the, uh, the PIREP, put some rules around it uh, so we can have um, uh, some standards so we're, we're, we're not having the pilot guess at, at really what the, the, the pilot who made the report, what the type aircraft was or what the um, conditions they, they experienced were. So that's, uh, that's really what we're kind of looking for. Uh, if you go to one more slide, Matt, I lost the slides, but um, you'll see the, um, uh, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, there you go. You'll see kind of the uh, proposed um, contractions and what we're, what we're looking at putting in there. Uh, now, when, it, when an airport assesses the runway, they're going to provide the runway into codes. Uh, we would expect the pilot, you know, we, the, I guess the, the guidance is, is the pilot will provide the uh, uh, the English language. Uh, well, the, the runway 30 left, uh, the braking action was medium. Uh, they're not going to go in there and call it a three. Uh, they're not going to provide it in thirds. They might say the last, you know, the last half or whatever, or the last third of the runway was was poor. You know, they, they may give that information to, to the controller. Um, so the controller will then you know, come back and say the, you know, breaking action poor by X type of aircraft. Um, but having this uh, uh, available in a PIREP um, with, with emerging technology, and there's actually technology out there today where pilots can, can go into the EFB and, and 
uh, create a pilot report. Uh, certainly would um, uh, bolster the uh, the uh, number of pilot reports for breaking conditions. Uh, we would not anticipate the um, air traffic controller going in and doing a pilot report for every landing. Uh, that that isn't that isn't feasible. But this, you know, this is being brought into, um, and you'll hear more about the the weather COI group. There's a pilot report, um, what we call a SWAT team, that's been been uh, developed. This is going to be put into that um, SWAT team at the next meeting. So. We'll have discussions as far as how you know how um, how this will be rolled out. You know what's going to be required to 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 get this in into the pilot report. Because if you look at the term PIREP, PIREP even by the way it's coded is primarily for occur in the air. So UA for upper air and UUA for urgent upper air. It's primarily always been used for things that that occur while the airplane's flying, not while they're trying to stop the stop or take off on the runway. Um, so unfortunately, the, you know, the pilot report um, needs to be expanded to include this, but this is really critical information and it provides, uh, you know, the pilots are really good um, estimate as to how things are trending as far as the runway conditions. Are they getting better? Or are they getting worse? Because like I said earlier on, the, the airport can't, physically go out and assess the runway at every 15 minutes or every landing. You know, they have their own guidance as to far as to how they assess the runways and, and when they're going to go out and they're going to clear the runways or, or treat the runways. Um, so <clears throat> that, you know, the, the landings in between that time or the takeoffs in between that time, pilots need to have the, the, the appropriate information for their takeoff and landing performance. So all that said, we're putting it into this uh, the pilot SWAT uh, team through the weather COI. Hopefully, we'll gain some traction there. Uh, pretty sure that AWC will be able to uh, accommodate this change. They've already kind of looked at it, uh, done the assessment as far as whether they can make the change or not. But like I said earlier on, there's there's more than just changing the the background. And one final comment before I close here. Um, there, there is, and you're probably going to hear a little bit about it. There is uh, a number of companies that uh, are providing with automated um, pilot reports of breaking condition based off the aircraft um, information, and and really that needs a home. Um, I've kind of talked about this at previous FPAWs. That this goes into the turbulence and uh, EDR and things like that. You know, automated. Or, or air apps, if you will, automated reports um, of, of critical information really needs to be shared. Um, and and as a as a group, I think we should we should be put, uh, pushing to share this in an open and uh, you know no charge environment. You know, it's it's information that's critical to uh, a lot of operations. Uh, can be very critical to some operations based on the performance of the aircraft. Uh, and the distance of the runway, but um, it, it's something that you know we should be pushing for as an as an industry, as a group, to uh, to share uh, this safety data. And so, if we have a place for it to land, um, and and it goes into a pilot report, you know, it could be listed as an automated pilot report. However, those are the details that need to be hashed out, I think. But it still provides that pilot or the landing pilots the an, an objective. Um, um, you know, information uh, beyond what the airports can provide due to their uh, their physical inability to uh, assess the runway every five minutes or whatever is going to be required. Anyway, I'll stop there. Uh, next slide. I guess it's just questions. All right. Thanks, Gordy. Uh, no John Hurley had a question about why not add this to the manual meter observation, maybe in the remarks uh, se section. Um, when you say manual METAR, you're talking about a contract weather observer or you're talking about a SARS or an NFOBS uh, observation, something uh, along those lines. And John, I'll let you expand on, on precisely what you meant. I mean, I have an assumption, but I could be wrong. So John Hurley. 
And you'll need to unmute yourself. It, uh, and and is is John also known as Jack, who I used to work with at Delta? Uh, he he said yes, but I think to uh, Gordy's question, not to yours, Matt. <laughs> so. Okay, so, I, I, uh, I, I guess that, it, yes, it, well, I, you know, let's have a discussion about that. I think that might be a challenge. Um, you know, right now we're looking at uh, a change to the to the snow intensity um, to issue a speci, and that's that's in the works, right? I'm sure I think we're all familiar with that, that act, but, um, you know, we've got, uh, and I don't know if Chuck Enders has joined this, but, you know, we've got a group that's looking at really what the impact of that would be as far as how many additional um, reports are going to be as, as snow intensity changes. Something like this um, would be a challenge to put it in, into the METAR, I would think. Well, one one would be a challenge because, you know, uh, it we'd have to kind of coordinate that international wide. Um, the RCAM is now the global standard. So, ICAO's adopted it. It's recommended. A number of uh, countries have already got on board with it. Manufacturers have got on board with the with the uh, uh, the TELPA recommendations. So it's worldwide. It's not just the United States. So something like that that would be like uh, like trying to steer the Titanic, I would think. Um, but it, it is a it is a interesting idea because it would be uh, pretty easily uh, to distribute that information versus pirates are today a bit clumsy uh, i'll say that because it's just not something that you know a pilot gets unless they have an electronic flight bag and and then the timeliness of that I, i'm not really sure based on the up uplink speed so any other thoughts or comments from anyone um well again bath at uh Harris says, uh, why is this modification to PIREP and not a new type of data? What about other legacy systems that process PIREPs? Uh, when you say legacy systems, I mean, can you expand upon that, Ken? Yeah, the um, so systems, FAA systems like LORP, OASIS, um, the ADSB systems, with it. That that process and you know decode pyreps. So you're going to insert new fields into the pyrep. Uh, there's potential it could break the decoders of those systems. Well, that that's very true. We we looked at we looked at it uh, with the flight services, and originally we we talked about having our own new field you know, slash BA for breaking action, mm -hmm. uh, which really meant made sense. You know, have have yeah. its own field. However, we realized pretty quickly on that we are going to break the the flight services system, mm -hmm. and and since flight services does a lot of this uh, information, especially in Alaska, uh, the simple way was to put it into the remarks section, and and then just educate people on how to read it. Um, so so that that's the, that's kind of the okay. intent is to is to put it just into remarks and and then educate people on how to read a PIREP. You know, we want to have it in a in a real basic format, uh, but you got to have the knowledge of the RCAM. I mean, you really do. You really have to mm -hmm. understand the different contaminant types, um, you know, that are out there. And and those are directly not, now they are they weren't in the past, but they now these are directly correlated to the uh, aircraft performance information that uh, the manufacturers pr are providing. They call it advisory information because it's not certified, but that information was, you know, the RCAM was basically the Bible. So that's that's basically what we came up with. We said, we need one hymnal to be singing out of here. You know, what are we talking about? So we looked at the contaminant types and the, and the depths, and that's really what started the whole RCAM is, is if you look at that and you go out and you assess the runway and you give it a contaminant type and depth, that's that you can correlate that by going to the manufacturer's advisory information and saying it's going to the aircraft will perform like it's landing on you know a, a medium friction runway you know something along those lines so that's that's how it was done but yeah you're right and and when we get into the when we get into the SWAT team 
uh, through the um, through the weather COI, I think we're going to have these. Well, I know we're going to have these discussions because you know we're we're not trying to break something. We're trying to fix something. Uh, and and Pyreps has has always been you know one of these one of these huge moguls that we can't seem to to get over. I mean, we, yeah. we continue to we continue to you know we know it's it's important information because everybody needs that that feedback. We need that feedback from the pi the pilot, but how how we get the information is the big challenge and the um if you put it in the remarks then it's probably okay unless you have a lot of extra characters you, you run the risk of overrunning somebody's buffer somewhere right uh, but uh yeah if it's in the remarks then then it's probably okay okay thanks good comment uh anybody else okay well, don't, oh. don't don't go away. Don't go oh, away. Oh. I'm, I'm going to assume Dave has his his mic muted because there's a bunch of other comments. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it, I guess when I talk louder to the computer, it doesn't help when you're on mute. <laughs> um, is, is Gary wanted to know is the latency uh, in Pyrep an issue uh, with feeding this to the Pyrep system? That's a good question. Uh, I don't I, I don't know if that's going to be a, a, a huge issue for this. Um, I, I will tell you, um, that, you know, it's better than we have now. I mean, not having the information is, is better than we have now. One of the things that we, we talked about with the, uh, like back to the telpo was we've got to have timestamps. We, we just have to have that information. And when, when a pilot does a, a landing performance assessment, quite often they're just saying, well, what is the pilot? You know what did the what did the airport say? Well, the airport said the uh, you know the braking action is a three, no three three three, right? They'll call it medium. Uh, okay, so it's a three three. They'll look in their table, but then the pilot is supposed to um, be also going. Well, what what was the time? And and what are the weather conditions since that time? You know, have the winds picked up? Is there heavy snow? You know, what what is occurring? And will I is that estimate, I'll call it an estimate, because at that point in time, it was, uh, you know, it was an estimate of the runway conditions. Uh, a pretty good estimate because they actually, you know, got hands on with the contaminant type and depth. But what has changed? So a landing performance assessment has to take into consideration the time of the report, what conditions have changed, and then any other what we call reliable braking action reports. And we say reliable, and we're, we're kind of, looking towards well it wasn't from 152 and i'm landing a 737. uh it's from another you know a 320 or another 737 or something along those lines so that's that's the information we we go to but latency certainly can be a problem um a, as we go into this that's something that will be um you know the other piece of this is how long do you leave it in the system you know i mean do you leave it in there for an hour do you leave it in there for two hours you know, what if it's Alaska and it's there's two flights a day? Do you do you kick the information out from this morning? Um, you know, so all that has to be discussed. One of the things that we had on the notum was after a day, uh, I believe that I believe it's still the day, but you know, we we kick the notum out. Um, you know, we've we've seen notums out there for for breaking conditions that have been in there for three or four days and it's 55 degrees. You know, it says breaking action poor. You know prior to the, uh, this R camp. So now, you know, yeah, latency is a huge issue, but good, good, good point. Um, and, and Josh, uh, just so I'm not uh, just, just barreling along here, it, it is 12.05. I'm not sure what your timing was. We do have several more comments that obviously I'm happy to go through here, but I did, I did want to be cognizant of whatever your timetable is. So do you have a time that you want me to try to work towards here? Why don't we try to cap it in about another five minutes if that works? OK, uh, I'll try to hit some of the highlights here. Then uh, Tammy Flo just had a comment about d uh, data policy, especially sharing is a hot topic in the uh, WMO now. Uh, Roger Sultan, and as a pilot myself, I, I kind of echo this a little bit. Uh, keep in mind, it'll be difficult for pilots to enter Pyrep well on taxi and uh, safety reasons. Best way to make this successful is to work with operators and ensure the crew enters the in report, usually via ACARS. Um, 
that breaking pi rep uh, is integrated into that. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Andy McClure, pilot surface report seems like a good idea rather than tagging along, making a pilot report do double duty or making METAR very long, long and cumbersome. Let's see if I have any more direct questions. Uh, yeah, PyRep SWAT. Yeah, that should be an exciting discussion. Um, OK, Andy had a question. Still have you notums? Oh, for now, they will exist within ICAO notums. They will still exist in, I think that's supposed to be ICAO notums unknown. O notums went away a few years ago. Um, oh, OK, that was in response to Tom George asked a question to Andy. Does Alaska still have UN O notums? So. Uh, I think that was it for direct questions. Uh, Matt Eckstein had um, biting off on Roger's other comments. Seems like sort of sensor or derivation from sensor data is ideal, automated for wo low workflow and objective uh, can be standardized more effectively. So I think that was it for direct questions. Those were the comments we had. And um, so I'll, and unless any more, more pop up here, I'll turn it back over to uh, you, Josh. Great, thank you, and Gordy, appreciate that. I do uh, well, definitely echo the the statement there that an airport operator is only giving a kind of a snapshot of, of what they see when they're out there on the runways. Um, for you know, we're required to report conditions as they exist. Um, honestly, that's pretty close to impossible for multiple reasons uh, during those changing weather events. Not the least of which, uh, at a busy airport such as ourselves, is uh, if we were to do that, there wouldn't be any time for airplanes on the runway. So. There's got to be a, a compromise there somewhere and any improvement in, in the pyreps is going to help us as well because what I just said, we're not out there all the time. We definitely listen to the pyreps uh, to get an idea of the trending ourselves on, on what our runways are doing. So thank you very much, Gordy. All, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I showed 20 after the hour, so uh, I believe we'll get rolling here again. Our third speaker for the day here is Matt Wandishan with uh, Noah, and uh, he's going to speak on a topic that I'm looking forward to, to learning about, uh, the evolution of probabilistic forecasts at Denver International Airport for their snow operations. So Matt, uh, well, first of all, I'm hoping you're you're on and uh, please take it away. All right, I am here. Oh. OK, so unfortunately, I thought I am on browser number three trying to get things to work and apparently I can see everything but it won't let me share all from right this one. Uh, so I'm afraid Matt Franzak is going to have to uh gonna have to do the honors stand by one Matt uh, I'll be right with you all right I tested this over the weekend and things seem to be fine but no problem So I'll start while Matt is bringing that up. I will. So this is some work that we did looking at uh, not this past winter, but the one before we are in the middle of. Of uh, kind of doing a follow up on on this past winter as well. But this is we did together with uh, some of the social scientist folks from NCAR. They met with the uh, the operations folks at the Denver airport and uh, and really try to look at their whole decision process and we and the goal was to try to find places where communicating weather uncertainty information could help in their decision process. So I'm here presenting. Dana Mueller is the one in our group who did the uh, she did the majority of the work the actual forecast evaluation part. And then Rebecca Morris from NCAR was kind enough to share some slides with me. I think it's basically her AMS talk from this past year that uh, is kind of broadly how to uh, issues, challenges with incorporating uncertainty information that touches on the, uh, the DIA snow removal process. 
uh, a little bit. So we start with Dana's slides, and then there'll be a shift to slides from Rebecca. All right. Matt. Okay, Matt. Uh, I, I believe I'm sharing your slides. Can you confirm it? I see it. Yes. Okay. Well, if you can see it, then the rest of us are in material. <laughs> All right, we can go to the next one. Um, actually, we'll go ahead and skip again, just a quick run through. Um, so, so again, I think I hit the, the top part of this. Um, and just to, yeah, so we are looking at the SREF. We're also looking at what was the version of the HER ensemble that was in place for the 2018-2019 winter. It has... Uh, the hurry, especially, is kind of constantly undergoing development. They're not uh, tied. After that, I was drafted into the army. That's been uh, it was. Um, it's not operational, so they're not tied to the same uh, the same schedule as the operational ensemble. So, or the operational her. So it's changing a lot, and as, and. Uh, just from the preliminary results that we've seen so far for this winter, it looks like it has improved a good bit. But this will be the SREF in the hurry. We also looked at a product that is issued specifically by the Boulder WFO for the airport. And I'm only going to show that tangentially here. Um, but there we can go ahead, Matt. <clears throat> So I think most people here are probably at least somewhat familiar with these with these two, the SREF on the left and the uh, hurry on the right. A lot of members on the SREF ensemble, just a few with the hurry. And then of course, uh, what you can see in these pictures is the big difference in the spatial resolution of the two products. Okay. The uh, something else to keep in mind is that the the SREF is issued four times a day, and uh, but is output only every three hours. So we only get three hour snow accumulations, for example. Whereas the hurry is only issued twice a day, it only goes out 36 hours, but we get hourly output. So that'll that'll affect how we're looking at things a little bit. Okay. And since we don't get that many snow events uh, in Denver over the course of one winter, we expanded our view to kind of other airports here in the Mountain West that are going to have at least a somewhat similar regime just to get some a better sample size for uh, for the model evaluation. The red dots here are um, I'm pretty sure that the hurry is currently CONUS, but back in 2018, 2019, uh, it went out to maybe about 110 west or thereabouts. Uh, so those red dots are not included in the hurry analysis because they were outside the domain. Okay. So we had a couple of different ways to define the events. The focus is going to be on the top two, but we looked we looked at the other ones as well. So one, just we have snow falling, snow falling, and the temperature is below freezing. And obviously, this is kind of it's the more generally the more important one. Although we do get events out here where the temperature is maybe a little above freezing, but the snow rate is high enough that we are accumulating on surfaces. Uh, and then snow falling and heavy winds, and then snow falling and reduced visibility. So those are the four events. Uh, but again, we'll be focusing mostly on events one and two. Okay. <clears throat> and then in the con, so this is snow removal operations. Basically, Denver has some different alert levels, and they'll bring in uh, a, a number of employees depending on that alert level to to man the operations running the plows and all that sort of thing and so they're not going to bring people in send them home because there's a break in the snow for a couple hours and then bring them back again so as a result we did a merging of events and we actually had it fairly large for this so any event within 12 hours the snow stop stop and picks up again Within a 12 hour period, we're going to merge those into a single event. Okay. All right, we can go on. 
So we, we looked at the events from each member individually from the ensembles and then uh, and then joined uh, kind of threw everything back together to get um, the ensemble events. And we'll see a little bit more of that in the next slide. And then the but before that, real quick, the snowfall levels, we are using 15 to one for basically we're using the variables from the model that tell us how much liquid fell as snow, the liquid equivalent. And then we're just using a, a flat 15 to one, which was climatologically about average for Denver and for most of the of the airports that we looked at. No, that's fine. Go ahead. It was perfect timing. Um, OK, and so then for the Denver operations, they um, they have some fixed decision points during the day. And the main one is takes place at 10 a.m. local time where they're making their planning for the rest of that day or even for the next morning. And so we we used that 10 a.m. cutoff as the um, as kind of the decision point with a roughly four hour latency of the models. I think the hurry has improved that slightly. Um, a four hour latency, that means so, so the models, so 10 a.m. the models had to be available um, by. And so you can see the, the chart here. So we're looking at the forecast, what was the most recent forecast information that is available at 16Z. Um, and then we're going to match the closest event that's within a 24 hour period. If it's more than 24 hours off, we're going to call it a completely different event. Um, otherwise, we will compare characteristics of the storms. OK. So uh, just a quick look at the uh, at the length of or kind of the distribution of the length of events from the observation. So regardless, the, the different colors here are that event one. So the upper left is snow only. Upper right is snow and below freezing. Lower left is snow and, and strong winds. And lower right is snow and reduced visibility. And so you can see that there are uh, many fewer events when we bring in the visibility or strong wind criteria. And, and you can see the majority of the events are kind of 10 to 12 hours or less, but there is a bit of a tail there to some very lengthy events, uh, likely as a result of that merging that we did. We can get some events that are going on longer than uh, for more than two days. OK. So when we, we're going to look at some 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles, and we're doing this in the same way. If you look at some of the, um, I can't remember, I'm not sure if they're still experimental, but some of the snow, uh, snow accumulation graphics that the Weather Service produces, 90th percentile is the low end. It's saying that you have a 90% chance or greater of getting at least this much snow. So 10th percentile is the is the highest so it's really a 90 percent chance and the 10 percent chance um sometimes people depending on how you look at some people want to flip that so just think that 90 percent is going to be the lowest and kind of the earliest start and latest end of the event um okay so we're going to look at first again how many events we just saw yeah you can go on um we just looked at that with the observations and then we'll look at the timing of the events and the and the snowfall so, um, so the three here represents the the ninetieth percent um, from the SREF. Thirteen is the is the mean. It's kind of close, given the number of ensemble members. The closest we can get to those probabilities, um, as seen on that table in the upper right. Um, and basically the upshot, so of course, if you're using the very lowest, if you just, if you only require a few, very few members of this ref to produce an event, then you're going to over forecast events by, by quite a bit, um, you know, two and a half to three times for just the pure snow event. Um, the mean or that 
uh, 50th percentile to median, I guess, is pretty close to, uh, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm using sir, but of course nobody can see that. Um, the, the median is pretty close to unbiased for both the pure snow and snow and below freezing temperatures. Whereas if we jump over to the right side, looking at the hurry, the hurry back in 2018, 2019 had a, basically just did not produce enough snow events. Even if you only required one member of the ensemble to snow, to call it an event, you were still under forecasting and you get to the median and you're, uh, you're even, you're down to about one in three perhaps events that it's capturing or, um, yep. Okay. Next slide. So that was events. Now we'll go to snowfall amounts. So just some just 2D histograms. So the observed, and we went ahead and bend this, and these are based, this is tied to uh, bends that the airport uses for decisions. So the first column is no snow, no observed. Second column is a trace to one inch. Third column is one to three inches, and the fourth column greater than three. So again, the uh, observations on the x-axis and then the forecast on the right. So as the uh, as indicated on the graphic, anything to the lower right are going to be events. You didn't forecast as much as was observed. And you can see there is a tendency um, toward over forecast actually a little bit with the SREF. There's more weight, more of the lighter colors um, to the upper left than there is to the lower right. Uh, by contrast, the hurry has uh, has more weight here on the lower right, especially there are a lot of just completely missed events. Um, although the majority of those are when there wasn't a whole lot of snow observed. Okay. Kind of looking at the same thing with a slightly different view. Here's just a distribution of the snowfall amounts when using on the left column, it's using that 90th percentile. So there's a 90% chance of getting at least this much snow. Uh, the middle is 50th percent and the, uh, the 10 is the high end snow. So as expected for the SREF, if you're going with the low end snow, you tend to over forecast. If you go, if we jump to the right, go to the high end snow, we tend to over forecast. And using the 50th percentile gives a pretty good um, it's certainly the distribution is centered on uh, on the zero uh, the zero error and you, um, and things go to those tails are pretty close to zero by the time you get to um, kind of three four or five inches. The hurry, on the other hand, uh, you see much less of a trend from the low end snow distribution to the high end snow distribution. Um, and so, yeah, so there's just not nearly as much spread in the hurry as in the SREF. And again, this is um, emphasized the 2018, 2019 version of the hurry. Um, and I think they knew it was under dispersive um, back then, but we can see a big difference between those two. Okay. So if we look at the timing of the events, um, so we're going to, have a few graphs like this, um, I believe so. To the left means that the forecast was early with the start of the event. And to the right means it was late with the start of the event. We've got the SREF on top and the hurry on the bottom. And again, we're looking at the, um, for each graph starting from the bottom, the 90th or that low end, the median, and then the, the high end where you need a lot of members to all agree in order to call this event. And again, with the with the SREF, we have pretty um, kind of what we would like to see, what we'd expect to see from an ensemble. If we're using the 90th percentile, we're going to be a bit early. It looks like on average, it's as, as much as uh, six hours or so early. Um, for the 50th percentile, it's pretty close to um, to being right on time for the, the median of the distribution. And if we go to the 10th, yeah, we're now a few hours late. And again, with the hurry, we see a hint of that same pattern, but everything is much more compressed. There's much, again, just much less difference, um, not as much spread in the ensemble. Okay. So that's the beginning of the event. 
if we go to the uh, to the end of the event, notice the change in the x-axis. Um, it basically doubled the uh, the steps there. The cessation errors are are larger on average than the onset errors. Um, but again, with this ref, we have kind of the expected pattern. Although even the 50th percentile now is shifted, it tends to be this ref tends to end events a little bit too early. Um, and uh, whereas if we go to the hurry, even using the 90th percentile, where um, that distribution is shifted quite a bit to the left, again, tending to end events too early. So the models in general do a better job capturing the beginning of events than they do the end of events. Okay. So a summary of, um, of just what we want uh, what we went through. This ref probably has a little bit uh, over forecast events a little bit, the hurry under forecast, the number of events. Um, and I didn't touch on it, but they under forecast the wind, both of them really under forecast the wind and visibility events. I don't know if anybody would be surprised that the models struggle more with that. Um, and with the snow amount, the this ref actually does pretty well. Uh, with that, the hurry tends to produce a little too um, too less snow. And when the poor resolution here in the second bullet is uh, resolution in the probabilistic sense that there's just not a lot of difference between a 10%, 50%, and 90% forecast, which again just gets back to the lack of spread in the ensemble. Um, and then, uh, and then over to the timing. As I was just saying, the models do better with onset than they do with cessation. The 50th percentile of the timing from the SREF is actually pretty good. Um, and the hurry events tended to start a little too late and end a little bit too early. OK. Go to the next slide. So we'll look at a couple of case studies. Um, if we if I'd been able to pull up my version, this these would be nice animations of the radar, but we'll have to settle for some still shots here. So the first event we're going to look at was uh, March 13th of 2019. And this was a, a, a nice spring blizzard that we had. Um, heavy fell, heavy snow fell throughout the late morning and afternoon. We had some people from our group that had gone out to the airport to try to observe the operations group in action, uh, which turned out to be a poor choice for two reasons. One, almost every airline had canceled their flights ahead of time. And uh, the uh, the roads trying to return from the airport were not in great shape and they it, it took them several hours to try to to get home. Um, luckily, I was not one that tried to join that that particular trip. OK, so let's see how the models did with this uh, strong synoptic event. Uh, so some mediagrams from the event itself. See, it started out rather warm. Um, temperatures around 50 dropped uh, overnight uh, into the morning. Oh, this is local hour. OK, so it dropped, yeah, basically overnight, um, got down into the into the upper 20s. We had some uh, some decent winds. Uh, the I guess highest here was around 10 a.m. with a sustained over 50 and gust approaching 80. Um, so I think it set a record for a non thunderstorm wind gust at the airport, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and those heavy winds continued through through the afternoon. The snow was heaviest again in the morning, um, but the snow continued. Um, I guess we started with a, a little bit of rain and then transitioned over to over to snow and continued snowing throughout the day. And uh, and then finally at the bottom there, you can see the visibility dropped to a uh, quarter mile, uh, half mile. Yeah, my, below half mile for most of that event. OK. So uh, this is looking at the day before. Um, 9 a.m. And, and so the SREF, uh, these are just, so it's kind of each member of the SREF showing the three hourly snowfall. Um, 
And so the, this highlighted period is, is when heavy snow was observed from the model, um, we're, which we're defining as an inch per hour. And uh, for this ref, since we just have three hour bends at the output, then we need three inches over three hour bend. You can see maybe it, it stopped the heavy snow a little too early, but you've got a number of members that are starting the heavy snow there at about 6 a.m. at about the right time. Um, the hurry, because of the because the hurry only goes out 36 hours, um, we're not it can't capture that full event. And again, it looks similar to what we just saw in that summary. It tends to be a little slow um, to start the event a little bit late, but once it did, it really every member showed heavy snow occurring during the afternoon at least. Um, had a, a decent handle on that. Okay, if we go to the next slide, we can see. Um, oh yeah, looking at the the visibility and the wind speeds. The visibility we um, didn't even try from the. Um, I guess for both of these, yeah. The this ref is not really built to give you good uh, visibility or wind gust measurements. Um, so you can see the. Um, by the time we get to, um, we get into the event, say by about eight o'clock, most of the members are showing less than half mile visibility and eventually all of the members show that. Uh, so it did pretty well. Um, the one hour wind speed, maximum wind speed is, uh, is underdone a bit. We saw it got up to, um, to about 50 miles an hour. Uh, observed at the airport, the model got up to 35 or so. Yeah, we had one member there that um, trying to get up to 40, but wind gust, um, again, a little underdone, but it is certainly showing you that wind is going to be a major factor during this event. Okay. This is that public forecast that are, or the, uh, the forecast put out specifically by the WFO for the airport, and uh, they captured it as well, wind gust, um, maybe a little underdone, wind gust to 50 knots. It certainly had the low visibility, that second highlighted section. And, um, and they were forecasting during that period, um, heavy snow, six, six inches or more, maybe 10. I believe uh, the airport recorded between eight and nine inches. Um, so they, the forecast office was on this one as well. Okay, next slide. So overall, how they did with the with the timing of this, um, and so the basically everybody captured it pretty well. There's a, a broad range from the SREF in terms of when it would start, even to the point where some members. It looks like we had at least one member that ended the event before another member had started it. <laughs> with the overlap of those, right? Um, it certainly captured the event and it captured the heavy snow, but tended maybe perhaps a bit too wide. The hurry actually did a pretty nice job with this. Um, although you'd, in order to capture the beginning of the heavy snow, you'd have to use, again, just kind of the low, at least one member as opposed to more of the median. Um, and the PSA pretty well on the, uh, on the front side of the event and, um, and held on to it a, a bit too long. Okay. So that was a nice strongly forced. Oh, perhaps, I guess I forgot to take the animation out of this one. Um, OK, so this was an event from just a few weeks prior. And at the beginning of this loop, you'll see there's just a little a weak band um, up northwest of the airport. Didn't look like too much, but developed into the stronger band that stayed over the airport for a while. Again, they ended the airport ended up with about eight inches of snow. I can say for my house, which is located a little west of I-25, we only had uh, about an inch and a half from this, um, and I'm I'm probably about 20, 25 miles from the airport. Um, so this was uh, definitely a trickier event. Uh, okay, go ahead. So the mediagram, we were cold all along, um, low to mid 20s through most of this event. Wind speed, you know, some wind, but not not super strong, mostly around 10 miles per hour. Um, there was a little bit of very light snow, um, some flurries in the morning, but you see this um, 
uh, this pickup in the snow rate uh, in the evening um, around 7 p.m. local time. And uh, and again, the visibility with that heavy snow was was quite low, down to a quarter mile. Okay. So looking the day prior, um, again, so in the morning from this ref, the hurry, because it was an evening event, if we look the day prior in the morning, it wouldn't capture that time period at all. So we jumped ahead to the 5 p.m. for the for the hurry. Uh, one member showing heavy snow, um, a number of members didn't snow at all. And then, um, and then for the hurry over here, and we had a couple of members, I guess three members total that showed heavy snow. Everybody had at least something, but most of them indicating just some just some light snow from this event. If we go to the next slide, the forecast office was also thinking, oh, they did mention. Um, so they're basically half inch to an inch of snow. There is a low chance of getting up to three inches um, if banding sets up across the airport. So even uh, even about 36 hours in, in advance, they did note that, hey, there is a chance of banding and we could get some heavier snow if that happens, although they weren't. That was not what they viewed as the most likely. Okay, so now we'll jump to the morning of the event. Oh, sorry, so quick a summary of what that, yeah, only one member showed heavy snow from this ref. The hurry was late with everything, PSA saying, no, that we're not really going to, um, we don't really have to worry about that. Okay. So now we can go to the day of. Yep. And go ahead again. And now the models are. Um, you see, there's definitely more snow. Uh, pretty every member of this ref. Um, thanks. Every member of this ref producing some. A few more members predicting heavy snow. Still not a lot, uh, but a lot of members are getting close to that uh, three inches and in three hour. Uh, Threshold, the hurry. Again, now they're all showing this chance of some good heavy snow. Um, but a bit later, uh, it's more of the second half of the period that was observed. Okay. Next slide, please. And um, the PSA now three to six inches from this storm, and then um, half to one inch. Uh, snow rates uh, where we might get some bands. Okay. Next slide, please. So, as we mentioned, the, the models were a bit late. The uh, forecasters did a, a nice job of pulling that back and uh, capturing the start of that heavy snow. They Again, maybe held on to it a bit too long, but uh, certainly not as much as the SRAF who tried carrying it all the way into the, I guess, noon the next day. Um, so this was a, a trickier event, uh, certainly not as much, not as much forcing, uh, trying to predict where a heavy snow band is going to set up is, is no small task. Uh, a day, a full day, kind of day and a half in advance, models really didn't have much of any idea, started to get an idea um, when we went to the morning of. Um, so it was nice to see them starting to latch on. I suspect if we'd um, gone to something, uh, kind of the next forecast run um, just before the event would have seen further improvement, but uh, let's go ahead. So that is, um, yeah, go ahead to the next slide. Um, so takeaway, yeah, models have improved. Forecasting specific snow amounts in particular is still challenging, but they do a, a better job with the timing of the events, and especially the start of the snow event, um, maybe perhaps a bit less with the end. Um, and then the next slide will just is a uh, graphical presentation of the kind of how everything performed. Um, and so we'll pause there and let people look at the those, it's really just a restatement graphically of what um, what I've touched on several times. And then we will shift to Rebecca's slides about the use of uncertainty information. And I'll just give the caveat that this is Rebecca's work that I am presenting and uh, I'm doing my best to represent her thinking on this. Okay. 
So I don't think too many people here would be surprised that um, yeah, weather prediction is inherently uncertain and it would be good to communicate that information to decision makers. They note, and this was back 2006, so quite a while ago now, but that relatively he little headway has been made in supplying actionable uncertainty information. Um, so that's kind of the, the key statement that Rebecca's keying off here for the next. Okay. So, um, so there was a, yeah, there's a paper that they published um, nearly 10 years ago now, but about five years after that, uh, that first report came back and they were noting that we've made some progress both in both in the weather side of generating uncertainty information, but even a little bit in the research and how to communicate this. But there are still significant gaps between the production of the forecast information and then how to communicate it and then for the users how to make use of that information. OK, so then we're going to run through some a few myths on this. You can go ahead and tap that through. Um, Oh, yep, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically okay, here, so this myth that, oh, well, people people don't really know how to use it. Um, and if they were, if the forecasters were just willing to use uncertainty information, um, we could get it, um, you know, this would be better. We, we produce it and, and they're not using it enough. And it's really just trying to emphasize that can't just throw it out there. It has to be working with the people understand that weather information is uncertain and we just need to work with partners in how to effectively communicate that information. OK. <clears throat> and at least there are keep going until you see the red one. There we go. So again, there's just some, some different stages in, in how we communicate risk from and kind of what the, you can see what the goal is. And as we progress down, it starts to transition from kind of the, the purely scientific towards, um, towards the, the social aspect um, of, again, bringing, um, bringing the users into the, really the development of the information and how it gets communicated. Um, uh, in order for that information to then get used effectively. Okay. Next slide. All right. Um, yeah. So again, and, and I certainly hear this a lot in aviation. People don't, they only want deterministic information so they can, they don't have to make the decision to just have it uh, made for me. Um, and go ahead to the next one or, yeah. Okay. So, and I think, um, one of the things, so as weather folks, we often think that the weather is certainly the most important uh, factor driving decisions. Why wouldn't it be? Um, but a lot of times there can be um, a whole bunch of other information that the users are taking into account. And perhaps the uncertainties in the weather are not the biggest thing that they're dealing with. And so there might be times where people interested on in the weather and it's being swamped by others but it doesn't mean that um, that we shouldn't be providing that information at all okay next slide so we get an example here from Denver that um, kind of as they laid out so they're making these decisions on bringing in the the crews to to run the plows and such eight to 24 hours in advance. Um, they are monitored, so they're looking at multiple forecasts and talking to people. They'll even start a few days in advance if there's signal of a, of a, of a system coming through. Um, but as one interesting thing is that the snow, you know, most models produce, they produce forecasts for snowfall, not so much snow accumulation. I'll, Sometimes that variable is in there, but the information that they're using for the snow accumulation um, is certainly not the most up to date. Uh, if the last time I checked the agenda, we'll get more information on that with the next uh, the next talk. 
um, certainly some about uh, making that decision of predicting the accumulation on the runway surface. Um, okay, next, I think we get another. All right, so there, there are a lot of other, there's a lot of information that they are pulling together um, and that weather uncertainty is only part of it. Another thing that we found with, with the airport that was, uh, that was interesting is relative to a lot of decisions that we consider, they have a pretty low cost for overacting. Uh, so if they bring in too many crew, yeah, they spent some money that they didn't need to, but they really have a goal of keep the, uh, the airport operating as much as possible. And they get leeway in, um, in making a, a conservative decision and bringing some people in when they weren't necessarily needed. We didn't get that much snow. Um, so that's, a, that's another aspect they have. Their goal is not to get the forecast perfect necessarily. Therefore, their goal is to keep the airport operating. So that changes how they use the forecast information. Okay. All right, I've certainly in, in evaluating forecast been guilty of this all the time of reducing everything to a single yes, no decision made it at one point in time and then you're you're kind of stuck with it. Uh, part of that is mathematically, that's a much easier uh, scenario to evaluate from using the, the model information. The decisions made in the entire decision process in order to accurately model that and see how that interacts with the weather information. But in, in actuality, it, it's typically not just a one time um, either A or B decision that's being made. And um, and so we need to keep in mind that the thresholds that people understand, the various decisions that they're making do vary with the circumstances, lots of circumstances, just the timing of where we are relative to the event, what the antecedent conditions were, uh, lots of factors that can come in to vary, um, which is a, a good argument for providing that uncertainty information since there's there's decisions are changing that's not trying to reduce that having the forecaster apply a single threshold and reduce that information is not going to be informative okay um <clears throat> so example here the the airport they have these as i mentioned at the beginning these different snow alert levels which dictate how many people they call in. Um, go ahead, keep tap that, I think, one more time. Um, yeah, OK, great. So notice one, so there, there is a kind of strict one to three inches, but there's also um, that the operations manager considers it in the best interest of the airport. And that's there on, on both of those. So they do have some very uh, determined conditions but overall, there's the, the manager can bring in whatever other information is deemed important and adjust that snow alert level. And then, um, yeah, that note at the bottom, in addition to the those snow accumulations, how long is the storm going to last? What are the temperatures? A type of snow? Is it a heavy, wet snow or a light snow that's going to blow off the runway right away? The winds, there are all sorts of other factors. Uh, that complicate the decision process. Okay. And tap it. So this was, uh, yeah, this is something else that I think we, we uh, where on the weather side, we fail often is that, again, we kind of think in the weather and then at the very end of the process, well, let's take the weather variables that we have and we'll try to run it through some function to um to adapt these to the the risk that's of interest instead of and what is being suggested here is really kind of the decision makers work the other way around they're looking at the decisions that they have to make and work backward to um the information that best that can help them best in making those decisions so i think as forecasters 
if we can, the more we can bring that perspective in and trying to work backwards from the decision process to the weather, the, um, the better we can then communicate the weather impact on their situation, on their decision. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, and this is just a little schematic of the of the decision timeline and um, the red boxes indicate where weather forecast information can come in to play. The blue is where we're, we're relying on observations more than forecast information to make those decisions. So there are several different points in the whole process where the forecast information can come into play, not just the, uh, that upfront decision of, uh, of setting the alert level and how many people to bring in. Okay. <clears throat> and so, um, right, so what we do going forward, I think the big, the big thing is, uh, I think, having a better understanding of the decisions being made and how the weather impacts those decisions to best be able to communicate the forecast information to the decision makers and so i, I put an x through the the old ketchup and mustard diagram which we don't see too much these days but i think the the thinking is still there of having this separation between the weather side and the operation side. And I think one of the downfalls of having uh, having that barrier is that it, it prevents the weather side from being more informed about the decisions being made so that they can do a better job, so the weather folks can do a better job of tailoring the weather information to the operation side. And I will, that's, I will leave it with that. So happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, thank Matt. You, Matt. Um, Brian Pettigrew and John Kosak all uh, both asked the question, uh, how might this uh, evaluation relate to the current ref based winter weather dashboard at AWC, especially looking towards the future? An eventual stress removal. Right. So let's see. How would it take that? How would it relate to the winter weather dashboard? Um, so one thing, uh, if I, I have not looked at the, the dashboard in a little while, but as I recall, airports are grouped into I can't remember how many groups, and there are different snow thresholds that are used in those different groups. It's quite likely that more resolution would be necessary there. That um, each individual airport can have different uh, different decisions. The other thing with these different alert levels, instead of having just one, uh, as I recall it again from the dashboard and the definitions uh, for uh, assigning the stoplight colors. Uh, it's more of a, um, I'm not sure that they capture the different levels of alert that the airports have. And so just a stoplight might not be sufficient. Um, on the other hand, it could be used um, perhaps to the, using the lowest level criteria just to, it just gives an indication of whether there's anything to worry about possibly at this airport or whether you know, you're in the clear for, for this period. Um, and then perhaps, <clears throat> I think one thing that we'll have to do, and I, as I recall, there's a bit of this with the dashboard of progressive disclosure. You have the, your top level information and then can click through, you can delve into it further to get more detailed information that could be, um, so that the decision makers for that airport can, can get more information, uh, more, uh, closely aligned with with their decisions, as opposed to um, having all that information up front that would be probably an information overlord. In terms of the the replacement, eventual replacement of the of the SREF, which my understanding that is um, slated 
to be replaced with the RRFS. And I, you know, it'll, so it'll be probably a, you know, the, the components of the SRAF, the members, there hasn't been a lot of work on improving those members in quite some time. As we showed, there's still 16 kilometer resolution. So I think the, the underlying model will improve. Unfortunately, we'll probably lose, um, we'll see a reduction in the size of the ensemble. Um, yeah, thanks, Brian. It's frozen since 2016. Um, we'll see. So it'll be a trade off between an improvement in the members and likely a smaller uh, ensemble size, which uh, will reduce information a little bit. All right. Uh, Frank uh, wanted to know, is it know, possible, is possible to take a retroactive, retroactive look, look using, using the newest new version, version of the, uh, uh, the, uh, of the hurry, the hurry to, see to see such a significant, significant improvement in the forecast? Well, let's see. When we say retroactive, if we wanted to apply the new hurry to that same 2018-2019 season, that would uh, that would really be the hurry folks that would have to go through and rerun it. I did mention we are in the process of looking at this for the 2019-2020 season. Um, yeah, it's not the same event, so it could be that you know if we see improvement that it could just mean that they were easier events to snow to forecast rather the fact that the SREF hasn't changed should help us with that so we can look at how the SREF performed this year versus last year to give an indication of whether it was a more difficult or easier year to forecast and and include that thinking we're also looking at the nbm in this year's uh analysis uh, to see how it does with the snowfall forecast. Uh, it was version 3.2 that we um, that we had access to during the collection time, not uh, version 4. They might have even just jumped to 4.1. Um, but so I would I would say it's unlikely that the her folks will have the resources available to go back and rerun for the same winter season. But we have some means to be able to make a reasonable assessment from this past winter season. And that we should have that within a few weeks, I think, of our, um, our analysis of, of this most recent winter season. OK, okay. Uh, um, Rob, Rob Banks, Banks had, a had a question about, question about uh, the likely uh, bias of snow melt. Snow melt. Results, results in the uh, uh, study due to choice, choice of a straight, of a straight theme to one theme conversion. To one conversion. And, and Dave, Dave Kochevar had, had a question, question about, about small, small impacts, impacts, about elaborating um, um, that the, that the uh, yeah, impacts, impacts are from, from accumulation of forecast, forecast snowfall. snowfall. And Rob, and had, Rob a had a response. I'll tell you what, tell you what Rob, Rob, why don't, why don't you expand, expand on, on what your, what question, your question was, was also, also uh, uh, maybe response to you there as well. And, and, and Rob, before, Rob, before you jump in, in um, um, Matt, can, can you mute yourself, yourself in between, between questions? We're getting a lot of feedback. Lot of feedback, 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 feedback. feedback. OK, absolutely. Let's see if that's better. Ah, much better. OK, uh, so I'm sorry, Rob, can you uh, can you expand on what what it was uh, your question about the uh, snow mounts and the uh, 15 to 1 conversion, and then you expanded on that from a comment that Dave had. So over to you, Rob. Sure. Thanks, Matt. I mean, it was a really good presentation and a study. Um, we were trying to really do similar things uh, while I was at Delta, trying to evaluate these type of events. Um, but to the first question, um, we had this problem too. I mean, I understand, you know, you always have to pick some type of a conversion because it's kind of difficult to have it modulate uh, fairly easy from the model output. Um, but obviously, there's going to be some bias. I don't know if you could let just at the very high levels, if you guys have any idea of the bias in the results you showed, but the snow amounts, obviously, the timing's you know, not going to be a problem or maybe even the events of heavy snow. Um, but it seems like there would be some overestimating of the total QPF from the models, from these ensembles due to like transitionary events. So obviously you showed the one going from rain to the heavy snow, but you're also gonna have that very short period of a few hours, maybe even 
some freezing rain to ice pellets. Um, so I don't know if you have some comments, you know, on the bias or plans for the future to kind of maybe post-process the model a little better. So that way, when we do these type of studies, you know, we're making a better direct comparison between the model and the observation. And back over to you, Matt, and you'll need to unmute yourself now. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I had started answering before unmuting. Uh, it, it is a good point on the, the 15 to 1, and we did not have all of the information from the model that we would need to try to calculate a snow ratio. Uh, I think the, I believe the HER now does, uh, I think they have changed internally how they calculate the snow ratio and, um, but I don't remember the details of it. I think it's still relatively simplistic. The uh, the NBM also does a, I think, an on-the-fly calculation, so we should uh, should have better estimates from that. I don't know how, you know, it's not a simple thing to uh, to evaluate, but yeah, it's going to lead to, I would say, probably something that if we had included even just a seasonal adjustment, we took the 15 to one was the was the average. Climato climatological average snow ratio for Denver. That March event is likely to be a lower snow ratio in uh, in the midwinter. Perhaps, it, well, maybe not with the snow banding that probably had affected the the snow uh, to liquid ratio. But in midwinter, we can certainly see twenty plus uh, to one for some events. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. It would be better to be able to um, to adapt that information to the individual storms. I think that's also even just that the predicted snow liquid ratio is probably something that the airport folks themselves would like to know. Is it again? Is it going to be a heavy wet snow that they've got to push off the runway, or is it going to be? Um, is it going to be something that's very light and that the wind is likely to blow around? to cause more visibility problems or that you're just not going to get as much. Um, yeah, again, there's there's a lot more information that could be communicated to them um, that would help in the decision process. Um, and I think with uh, Dave, I see his question there about the. This forecast to the snow accumulation versus snowfall, I guess the NWS accumulation more, but the models are often um, <clears throat> are often looking at the the snow that is falling and they're and then they're calculating the liquid they're communicating the liquid amount the liquid equivalent of snow that is falling um, from the microphysics of the models uh, that we actually just ran into this something recently talking with the SREF. They also do have an accumulation variable that is calculated from the land surface aspect of the model, and there's not necessarily good communication between the two. Um, so those, you could look at how much snow is falling and look at the accumulation and have those numbers not fit together, um, where you have more accumulating than, than it said fell, for instance. Um, so, and, and the models don't have up-to-date information, of course, of what the soil temperature is or things of that sort, which again will lead into the next talk, I believe. Um, so how's that? I, I think I rambled enough there. Hopefully there was some good, uh, an answer to your question in the midst of that. Yep, that sounds good. Uh, one other uh, comment here from uh, Nathan Polderman uh, that kind of tags on to uh, your comments there, talking about ground temperatures having a big impact on snowfall accumulation, as they saw in the uh, early season snow event uh, recently at uh, Denver. And, and um, he also adds that uh, United would be happy to partner with you on future studies of 
probabilistic forecasting at Denver winter events and um, looking at their decision making time horizons. Consideration is quite different, more complex than for the uh, airport facilities. Um, snowfall amounts not really helpful in some of those decisions. So uh, that all kind of ties together there. And um, Tara Lagwig, uh, her data includes variable density snow algorithm, which ranges from 5.1 to 17.1 based on microphysical variables and model temperature. Uh, that's offered as a comment if you, uh, you uh, well, yeah, just Tara. Tara is one of the uh, is one of the developers on the her team. So that's that's good information from the source. Thank you, Tara. And it looks like the looks last like the comment we've got is from uh, Jacob Carley. Current SREF will be replaced by a combination of GFS, which now thirty one members and twenty five kilometer and the future RRFS with a three kilometer rapid update ensemble. So that is a additional comment. Uh, I don't see any more questions or comments there. So Matt, unless you have any closing uh, remarks there, I'll send it back, send it back over, over to over Josh. Josh. Yeah, no, just uh, thank you. And Nathan, I'll reach out to you um, offline. I appreciate it, everybody. Great. Thanks. Yes, Matt, thank you very much. That was great. Um, I think it's, I guess, just a quick summary. It's good to know that there are, keep in mind that there are different requirements from forecasting from the different players at an airport, whether it's the authority where I come from or uh, the airline or, you know, other tenants such as our contract de-icing uh, companies and, and folks like that. So a lot of different users for for the weather data. Um, I think it'll be a great transition dovetails nicely into the talk that Seth and I will do here, but let's take another quick break. Let's say uh, 10 minutes from now, 1330 Eastern time, we'll, we'll restart again. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, let's uh, get moving here with our final, final presentation for the uh, winter weather session of this fall's FPAW conference. Um, I am Josh Paris. I work in operations at the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. Um, so Seth Linden from NCAR and I are going to talk about a, a, a system we've uh, kind of developed called the Runway Friction Closure Prediction System. Um, maybe could use a little better acronym for that, but uh, we haven't quite come up with a, a catchy one quite yet, but we'll go with that for now. Um, so at MSP, you know, we are a, a cold weather airport. Um, Plenty of snow, maybe roughly 50 inches um, on average per season. A relatively busy airport, a uh, large hub airport. Uh, normal times, we'll have about 1,200 aircraft operations per day. Of course, as everyone is well aware, we're not in normal times right now with the pandemic. Um, as of July, the last data we have, we averaged about 583 per day, so less than half of what we're normally doing. But uh, that being said, we'll move into winter and uh, continue taking pride in, in what we do to, to operate a safe and efficient airport, even through you know the, the worst of, of winter conditions. Over the years at, at Minneapolis, we we kind of constantly been fine tuning our practices dealing with the weather. Um, you know whether it's communication and coordination with the airlines, the FAA, uh, other tenants, and of course our internal departments that we work with as well. Uh, folks such as our uh, plow crews out there, you know. We, pretty much have sharpened everything as far as uh, their training and their equipment that's available to them. You know, um, technically speaking, they're able to clean a 10,000 by 200 foot runway in as little as 10 minutes. Um, so we're pretty much uh, dialed in as far as that goes. Um, so we've started to expand upon that to try to improve things. Uh, we have, a, for many years, have added an intensive surface friction testing program. Uh, we do three different you know, types of runs during the winter, uh, during storm events, pre-runs, post-runs, and what we call bag runs. Uh, real quickly, a pre-run is what we do before. We do any treatment of the runway just before. That's the first vehicle on a runway closure. Uh, post-run is the last vehicle off the runway is a friction tester, uh, determining what, uh, what the conditions are as we get done treating the runway. And then I mentioned a bag run, uh, acronym for build a gap. Basically, we're taking a snapshot of the runway conditions uh, on an open runway. So air traffic is building us a gap to get out there and, and run down the runway. So the other piece that kind of runs into this is the data collection. Um, we 
typically uh, through a winter storm for many years now have have done this old school Excel spreadsheet where we track uh, uh, our way through a winter storm. You can see the uh, runway labeled up here, a closure time, some pre-run information from our sob runs, uh, the depth of snow and whatnot. We're inputting all of this manually into the left-hand columns and some data is then uh, calculated for us on the right, including the timing since the last closure and, and depth and whatnot that is tracked there. Um, our goal, my goal and my as I'm making these decisions is to try to close the runway no earlier than we need to and no later than is safe. So uh, in this case, maybe this pre-run here is closed a little bit too early. We want to try to close it when it's right at or above numbers of 20 mu. So this one here is real close to perfect with the 22, 21, and 20. You know, essentially, we're keeping the runway open as much as possible to allow airplanes to uh, go up and down, but we don't want it to get to the condition that is dangerous. So uh, that's, that's our internal goal right there is to close it with friction numbers right at or above 20. So we use a spreadsheet to kind of track our way through the storm, uh, kept, you know, combining the uh, pre-run data with the time since the last closure, assuming that the storm is essentially tracking the same way as far as accumulation, snowfall rates and whatnot. Um, we'll use this to as part of our decision making guidance on how soon we need to close a runway again. We do try to keep a rolling three hour window of a plan of runway closure so that air traffic and the airlines are aware of, of when our runways will be closed. Uh, three hours geographically where we are, three hours covers basically any flight from either coast uh, domestically. So we try to get uh, get a good idea out there what our plan is as the airport operator for when runways will be closed. Now, um, going on from there, essentially uh, what we wanted to do was try to take this spreadsheet and more or less make it much smarter and automated. So uh, uh, basically reached out to Seth Linden and the, and the experts at NCAR um, for their weather forecasting and data modeling um, talents. And uh, they've kind of over the last couple of years built this system that we are uh, implementing um, almost, uh, you know, for real this fall will be, or this winter will be uh, actively using it. And uh, with that, I want to let Seth explain the details on, on the system that he has helped develop for us. All yours, Seth. Thank you, Josh. Um, that was a great introduction. Um, first, can everybody hear me just fine? I want to make sure. Can you hear me, Josh? I can hear you, Seth. Yes. Okay. If you stop sharing really quick, I'll just do a quick introduction with video. I'll then turn my video off and then I'll start presenting. Okay. Um, can people see me via video? Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, just a quick thank you again, Josh. That's a very nice introduction, a great lead in um, to uh, the talk that I'm gonna give. So a little introduction, my name is Seth Linden. I'm a software engineer at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. I've been there working full time now about 20 years and I've been working on surface weather type projects, um, decision support systems for Department of Transportation, DOTs and also for airports, um, basically for the last 15 years. And so, this project is really related to our decision support systems where we've expanded it to now do runway um, friction prediction and, and take that a step further and try to do closure guidance. So with that, I will start presenting my screen here. Can everyone see the slideshow? Not yet. That would be a no. Oh, it's, oh let's see. You're in top. Okay, sorry. I have to select entire screen. Okay, sorry. I need to share it. Hold on just a second. We got you now. Looks like progress there. Can you see the beginning slide on the slideshow? Yes, yeah, right. so. Okay, excellent. So Josh gave a really nice introduction, so I won't spend too much time here, but I did want to thank, you know, Josh is the primary contact at MSP, along with uh, John Ostrom. I really wanted to thank MSP and also MAC, which is the Minneapolis or, or the Minneapolis Airport Commission. And um, this work obviously would not be possible without the support from those guys, and it's been a great project. 
So real quick with the outline, I'm gonna go over uh, some background of the need for this type of system, what it really is, and then we'll get into a system overview. We'll then really look at how we developed the system over the course of two years. As Josh said, we've done now two phases of the project, uh, basically two years, each phase being one year. And so we'll look at um, our, our machine learning that was done in phase one and in phase two, we'll look at some initial verification. And then we'll also look at some of our output examples during storms, talk a little bit about the web display and future plans. So today I'm gonna to be talking, like Josh said, about this runway friction enclosure prediction system. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is not just predict what the actual friction values are on the runway, the actual mu values, but ultimately whether or not the runways need to be closed. And we wanna give guidance on you know, how long the closures. And we end up with a product like this, plus some other products where basically we'll get into the details here, but red sort of indicates when the runways need to be closed. There's a little bit of improvement in between treatments. And then you see the storm improving towards the end of the forecast. That's a six hour forecast. And I'll be talking about how do we get to this product. Okay, so, you know, as Josh had said, basically, you know, what, what, what is the need? What is the background for this type of product? And really the, the thing was, is that Minneapolis and other airports that experience a lot of snow, they're, they're typically relying on traditional methods, you know, looking at different weather data sources. And then of course, in terms of runway friction, as Josh had mentioned, they're taking measurements um, using a friction wheel. They're entering that manually into a spreadsheet. They're doing some relationships. They're looking at the data and then they're trying to make a call. And a lot of this is manual. And so um, MSP came to us and, uh, you know, came to NCAR and asked if we could create an automated system that would help predict the friction values and the closure alerts. And, and again, I just want to thank, um, you know, Mac and then, you know, Josh, John, Kyle and Renee. This project certainly would not be possible without their uh, support. We, we really, really appreciate it. So what is the RFCPS, the Runway Friction Closer Prediction System? In essence, really what it is, it's a system that combines machine learning models. It utilizes machine learning models with a back-end weather forecast to predict runway friction values and runway closure alerts. And right now the system basically updates every hour um, and it produces six hour, uh, it produces a six hour forecast at 15 minute lead times. Now we have the mechanism in the system if we can receive real time friction data, we utilize that data and we'll issue a sub hourly update um, based on the latest forecast data and observations. And so, like I said, it's, it's basically trying to predict the same mu values that are measured by the friction wheel, but we're making a prediction six hours into the future at 15 minute lead times. And then we basically apply rules of practice uh, to determine um, whether you know, runway closure is likely or not. So this is a diagram of the runways um, at MSP. And this shows basically how we set up our site locations for this project. So MSP takes friction measurements on these one third segments along their primary runways. And you can see the A, Bs and Cs those are the, the basically the one third segments. It's the endpoints and the midpoints of all the major runways. And so we created our forecast locations right at these points. Um, so they 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 are co correlated with where MSP is taking the friction measurements. So what is the system? What is the real time system? What does it actually do? So what we're doing is is where we have a back end weather engine. It's really like an MDSS system. I'll get into that next, and it provides a weather forecast and a road condition forecast, including a pavement forecast and pavement conditions for each runway segment point that I showed. And then we have an application that basically reads in the forecast data and it calls different machine learning models that predict friction. So we'll talk about how these models were developed, but it's basically it related, you know, observed weather to what the observed friction values were. And so we get a friction prediction after putting in the forecasted weather and pavement conditions. And then we also have a separate application that's constantly looking for real-time friction data from MSP. And of course, that's used to forward air correct um, the forecast if it's available and we'll reissue a forecast. But ultimately, we have a real-time application. It sort of brings everything together, the latest weather data, the latest friction forecast, and then it creates a bunch of output products. Well, it'll forward air correct the forecast if applicable, does some time conversion, and then it produces some of the output products that we'll look at, such as the runway closure matrix I showed you, some multi-panel plots that show some, 
some important um, forecast variables. And we provide this in several formats. And, and at the very end of the phase two, we actually created a web display um, for much easier viewing. So MSQB just pull up the very latest um, friction and closure forecast. So here's a very basic system diagram of what the RFCPS is. On the left side here, basically the road weather forecast system, the RWFS and our road condition and treatment module, that is the basis of, of um, an, an MDSS-like system. And like I said, um, MDSS was actually started uh, as a federal highway initiative back in the early 2000s. Um, they contacted NCAR and other research institutions to really develop decision support for um, roadways and pavements during winter storms to, to indicate you know, where the problems are gonna be on the roadways, how much snow is gonna accumulate based on road temperatures and precip rates and whatnot. So the back end system really on the left side here is the MDSS that does take into account observations. And then ultimately we feed the forecast data into these friction prediction models. And these are machine learning based models. And these models, I'll get into how those models were formed, but they also used friction data. And down here we can see in the lower part of the graph, we have a quality control module, which is quality controlling real time friction data, but it was also used to, to quality control the historical data, which was used to building the models. But in terms of the real time system, we feed the weather data into these machine learning models. We also look for the real-time friction data. It's quality controlled. We do forward air correction if, if, if applicable. But if not, basically we, we end up with a friction prediction from some different models that I'll go over. And then we apply rules of practice and then we come up with some closure alerts. And then we ultimately create some uh, easy to understand output products that show friction values and runway closure alerts. And those are sent to MSP, you know, via a web display right now. So a little bit more on the back end portion of the system. This is a diagram that really describes the maintenance decision support system that NCAR has developed. Um, there's other private entities that use this type of setup across the United States. But what goes into that? It's really um, on the left side here. Some of you may or may not be familiar. The weather engine that we use is an engine called Diecast. And really what it is, it's just a statistical post-processor of model data. It can take any sort of model data sets. We usually choose um, the best model data that are freely available. And it uses observations, which you can see on the left side, to actually tune the system. So it's a, it does a combination of models. It corrects the models, doing like a bias correction for each model. And then it combines the models based on past performance. Um, the system also includes some National Weather Service MOS products. But really, the heart of it's based on the HER the one hourly NAM, the one hourly regional GEM model, um, and the one hourly GFS. And it also uses observations. And then ultimately that, that goes into our, um, into diecast, which really is our road weather forecast system. And then we, we feed that data into a road condition and treatment module, which has a pavement model in there. Um, it's a modified version of the Metro pavement model, which is developed by Environment Canada. And we, NCARS modified it. Um, for speed, efficiency, and to fix some bugs. So we run that, and then that gives us, you know, pavement temperatures, pavement conditions, accumulation of snow and ice on the road. And then, so we now have a forecast of all of those fields, including the weather fields, and that then feeds into the, the RFCPS system. And then ultimately we create the uh, output products and sent to a web display. Okay, so how did we go about developing this system? So what I'll do first is we'll go over kind of what we did in the first phase of the project, what we learned, what we had to change, and then phase two, improving on the models and where we ended up with uh, the forecast products now. So in phase one, uh, we wanted to create several different machine learning models, and we were using historical friction data and ROS observations from the airport. We started by looking at uh, a Cubist uh, machine learning model, which is based on regression. We looked at gradient boosted trees, uh, GBT, that's more of a, um, a tree model, random forest we looked at. And I also had set up an expert system, just a rules-based algorithm, just to see if I could out predict the machine learning models. And it turned out that I couldn't beat the machine learning models. So these models are set up to predict the friction mu values between zero and one, if it's in decimal form. And as you know, you know, as, as Josh should show, 0.2 or something around 20 would be very slick. That's when the runways need to be closed. 
and something around 0.8 or 80 would be very tacky. That's like summer type conditions with, with no slip at all. So we gathered a lot of data and I'll go over that a little bit, quality controlled it, set up some initial models, and then we started to look at the data using some verification. And of course, we realized that we had to change the target initially. Prior to getting into that, um, we'll, we'll look at some of the results from phase one. Let's, let's take a little bit of a look here at some of the data that we used. So for phase one, we had three years of data, uh, three, three winter seasons from 2014 to 2017. We had um, spreadsheets that were given to us from MSP that had friction data. And as, a, as you know, that's measured by the airport surface friction tester being dragged behind a, a vehicle. Um, and of course, the friction values are at inconsistent times, all related to when a storm is, is passing through. You know, they're going out there and taking measurements when they feel like there's an issue with snow and ice on the runways. And as Josh said, they close the runways down, they're taking measurements, they treat the runway, they take more measurements. And um, those are all time stamped, but they are, are at inconsistent times. And then basically what we wanted to do is we wanted to relate the weather data to what the friction values were. And the best weather data that we had was the ROS data at MSP in particular. Um, there are ROS units. There's several above ground units co-located with the runways. Um, these are Weisla ROS units. Um, they give five minute data of both the atmospheric fields and the pavement conditions. So from each above ground unit, they, they are connected to these pucks that are embedded in um, each of the runways. And so there's quite a few ROS. I wanna say there's four or five above ground units, maybe three or four, and then there's several pucks. And so you really get a nice indication of what the, 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 the weather is and what the pavement temperature is. And as it says here, you get things like surface temperature, the pavement temp, you get the, the surface state, air temp, dew point, all of the, the common state fields. We also had as backup um, in light of any missing data with the ROS data, we had the ASOS data um, from the airport. That's from the KMSP ASOS there and that they have access to one minute data from there. And so that's a nice uh, data set as well to su supplement some of the weather data. So in terms of preparing the data, uh, we applied QC uh, to all of the data sets. We removed stuck values. We removed outliers. You know, if one ROS was varied greatly from another ROS in terms of the payment temp. And then we ultimately combine the data sets in terms of time, um, time stamps. So for any given friction measurement, we're looking for the most recent observation from the ROS of the ASOS. Um, we always check the ROS first because it was more co-located with the actual airport, the actual runway locations. But if we didn't have that data, we could fall back to the ASOS for some weather data uh, to fill in the gaps. But it was mostly ROS related data. And then we also did some combining in, in some derived fields. We sort of looked for what was the worst weather conditions over the last hour, over the last three hours, what's the, the, the most severe condition, you know, was there snow falling over the last uh, three hours and whatnot, because, you know, you could have cases where the snow has actually fallen on the runway, it's ended, but you still have snow and ice on the runway, and so you have friction issues. So as I mentioned, really, you know, when we very, when we first set up the initial models, what we did is we targeted all of the actual friction values. And this is a, a nice example here, both the top and the bottom plot. I'll focus on the bottom plot. The dotted lines are the observations from all the different runway midpoints or endpoints. And so you can see in the dotted lines here where my cursor is, you have an up and down in friction values related to treatment. So obviously the friction values are higher um, either before the storm starts, the snow starts, they fall. As you can see here, they do a treatment on the runway, they rise, they fall again while it's snowing, they rise again. And so all the, all the spikes are related to treating the runways. And when you, you take into account both all of the friction values at once, you end up with this average, which is these are, these are the initial model output. The very initial model output for these runway midpoints show that it's right in between the high and the low points. And that's not what we were after. We were really trying to say at least initially, can we predict what the friction values are gonna be in light of bad weather? And so this was just going right in between both the high and low values. So as I mentioned, we had to change our target. Um, so, you know, without, in this case, in phase one, we didn't have historical treatment data um, that was provided to us. That comes along in phase two. So it was very hard to model the spikes because all the spikes were really during a storm are related to treatment um, applied to the runway. And that would be either sanding, or plowing um, and rarely some chemical. So we needed to rethink the problem. And 
you know, we really wanted the system to be able to inform MSP of like, hey, you've got a problem coming. We need to get the low values first. Those are the most important. And so we changed the target and the engineers met and we came up with the idea that we would train um, the models to actually target the worst friction value over the last hour. And so this, this ended up producing much, much better results in phase one. Now, of course, you're not going to capture the up and down in friction values due to runway treatment. And as I said, that comes in phase two, but at least we were getting the lower values associated with the, the bad weather conditions. So just highlighting this um, again, we were we were targeting now. I pointed um, the arrows to these lower friction values, and you know this was during a storm. This is a nice plot because the left side of the plot, you can see that while the storm was occurring, you had these up and down in friction values along different runway endpoints, midpoints, with low values while it was still snowing, and then ultimately on the right side, you can see there was big recovery as the event ended. And so we decided initially to target these low friction values. And ultimately, we ended up with a, a nice initial product. And this is an example of one of our forecasts. So this is a six-hour forecast that was from February uh, 24th, 2018, generated at 15Z, so around 9, 10 a.m. in the morning. And the black line is the actual observations from MSP. Um, there's a line sort of drawn in between the points. So, you know, the actual points are probably like these high and low, low points. But those are the observations in black. And, and this was some of our model output from the different machine learning models. And what it's showing is model output from Cubist in blue and from gradient boosted trees in red. You see that the models do fairly well. The Cubist model for this particular case did fairly well at getting the low points uh, during the storm. So that was really the first step. Can we, can we get the reduction in friction values um, during bad weather, inclement weather? And then we also started the process of doing initial forward air correction. So this wasn't fully built out, but we started the process of gathering friction measurements in real time from MSP. We had to hook into their APIs uh, that provide this data. There was always work to do that. And so we were looking for real time friction values um, from the airport shortly after they've, you know, basically after Josh and John, the measurements come in from the from the friction wheels, they come into their system and they post them to a system, that data gets saved. We link into that system where we can get the real-time friction data. So this is just an initial example in phase one, we really didn't have it all set up to, you know, recreate uh, the latest forecast data, but we could at least apply some forward air correction by, by hand um, using some of the real-time data. And this just shows you the impacts of forward air correction. So on the top left, it's an example forecast where the observations are in black again. Um, uh, the forecasts coming from the different machine learning models are in, in blue, yeah, orange, and green here. And you can see initially in this case, the forecast was off, probably because there was treatment applied. And we had no indication of that in phase one. So you can see that there's a big difference in values. But after forward error correcting it, you get a big correction in the friction values coming from the models in the first three hours. And you can see that now in the plot on the right hand side. Okay, so we were happy with what we did in phase one, but you know we knew that there was much more to go in terms of actually trying to model the up and downs um, in the friction values related to treatment and just to get a little bit more precise and accurate indication of what the friction values are during the storm. So what were our phase two goals? And I should say we, we did the phase two work basically between February of 2019 and April 2020. So phase two uh, just ended relatively recently, this last spring. And so we really wanted to improve the models by taking into account actual treatment information as provided by MSP. And we were gonna you know, build new machine learning models that take into account the actual treatments. We also wanted to improve the forward error correction and modify the system to produce sub-hourly updates upon re receiving real-time data. And in, in, th in that case, it corrects the latest forecast and it creates a new forecast that's corrected and that still goes out to six hours. And that's typically a sub hourly update. And then we did end up adding a couple new variables that were uh, not related directly to the runway friction. That was for runway crosswind potential and for runway blowing snow. I'll talk a little bit about that two important variables as well, but sort of tangential to the runway friction. And then ultimately, um, and this wasn't necessarily planned. We had a little bit of extra funding at the end and we just decided it was hard for MSP to really load our plots in the closure matrix. And so we, de we developed an easy to use web display application that can be 
used on both a desktop, um, a tablet or a phone, and it's easy to view the very latest output products, no matter what, it always will show the latest forecast and we'll look a little bit at that. Okay, so in phase two, what did we do with the data? Um, we obviously used more historical data. In this case, um, we had data from the winters of 2017, 2018, also 18, 19, and part of, of the early winter in 2019. We used similar QC techniques to line up the friction data with the ROS uh, data or the ASOS, mostly ROS data. And then in this case, um, MSP did quite a bit of work. I really appreciate the work that they did to create some spreadsheets for us where they actually put in um, you know, what their, their, their pre and post run friction values and whether or not you know, there was treatment. And so we had a spreadsheet that basically told us what the initial friction values were um, of the bag run. And then there was an indication and that was time stamped. And then there was an indication of treatment. And then we had the post treatment values. And so we could see the change in the friction values from before and after treatment. And that was all time stamped. And really initially, all we were interested in this is, is there, has there been any treatment? We weren't trying to get specific in this case. And when I say treatment, was there sanding? Was there plowing? Was there occasional um, chemicals applied? We, we didn't really get into trying to disseminate between those. It was like, is there treatment? Is there not treatment? How does that affect the friction values? So we did, we developed more QC, you know, and for example, there are cases, as you probably know, where, but it, it, and you have to QC these out because the machine learning models just don't like these relationships, but there are times when the friction values actually go down after treatment. And that's fairly rare. And that's typically only when you have very heavy snow falling at greater than one or two inches per hour. So it's overtaking the runways almost immediately. And so normally we're keeping values where the friction values increase or improve after the treatment. And so we had a lot of good data to work with for phase two. So then we took that data and we really wanted to create new machine learning models. And like I said, we were just developing models that had a treatment yes, you know, a yes or no flag, one or a zero. And so after doing some development, and we'll get into this a little bit more, we realized that the best way to communicate this information was to actually develop three models, ultimately. Um, and we developed a model that our, our, our initial goal was to, to develop a model that takes into account um, any forecasted treatment coming out of our system. So it was, it was built based on all of the yes treatment scenarios and the no treatment, so the pre and post friction values. And that model itself is supposed to be designed to say, hey, if there's a forecasted treatment coming out of MDSS, this model can react properly, and we'll show you that, where the friction values change, and then you know the treatment goes away and it comes back down. But the biggest issue, as, as you may imagine, is, is that from MDSS, we're forecasting treatments based on a whole collection of weather data and weather forecast data. Those treatment forecasts typically will not line up all the time when, when MSP actually does their treatments because they're gonna treat aggressively to keep the runway open. Um, and so, you know, MDSS may be more conservative in its recommended treatments versus what MSP is actually doing. And so there's times when we know the runway is being treated, but our system isn't necessarily predicting it. So we came up with this great idea that we would develop a second and third model. So the second model really just assumes it's built on all of the yes cases that there was treatment, what the post run values were. And so this second model assumes continuous treatment if you were out there basically treating the runway um, at every time step. And then a third model on the opposite side was developed for a case where there was no treatment being applied. So it's sort of the worst case uh, scenario. And you'll see in, in the subsequent plots that this really gives a nice bounding um, lines, bounding box or bounding lines of what the possible friction values would be irrelevant of treatment. But of course, we still have a model in there that will react to forecast to treatment. And then we wanted to basically examine how, how all these models compare and how they can be used together. So this is a plot that shows some of the initial work, um, some of the initial work for phase two, where again, these models are all perfect prog models, which is actually really nice because it's all it's relating is observations of weather and pavement temperature to what the friction values are. And, and that makes it really nice because it's irrespective of lead time. It's also irrespective to some degree of location. You know, we know we could apply this friction model likely in Denver. Um, we would want to tune it uh, to specific data, but because it just relates observations to friction values, you can basically use this. 
And so we first developed the models using observations. The observations here are in the dotted red line and just using observations. So this isn't using forecast data. You can see that the forecast now is reacting pretty well to the friction um, to the treatments. Uh, when there was treatment, you have a rise in the, in the friction values. And then in between, you have uh, a decrease in the friction values when there's snow still occurring. So that was a good result initially. So ultimately, um, what did we do here? So we, we again, we looked at a whole set of models. We tried to use some of the same models that we did before. We developed actually a new graded, gradient boosted tree model, um, a new neural net model. Um, and there was another flavor of the GBT model called an optimized GBT model, which um, one of our engineers was playing around with some of the settings in the machine learning there. We also looked at um, some new Cubist model results. And so we did assessment of the friction models compared to observations. And we basically tried to look at and see which models were doing best. And you know, we looked at things like hit miss scores, MAE, RMSE, and we also looked at several case studies. And ultimately, what we determined for, for all of this um, is that using a co combination of the machine learning models. So, you know, the machine learning models would form the basis for all three of the forecasts, which I'll describe next. But we really combined two different machine learning models to come up with our final machine learning model for each three of those. So ultimately, we decided based on statistics that using a model, um, a machine learning output that was 80 percent GBT, gradient boosted trees and 20 percent cubis gave us the lowest errors overall. So we use this combination for all three of the models, which I described below this. So remember, oh, let me go back one there, that in order to give the best information, we have a standard friction forecast um, that gives expected values if there's, if there's forecast treatment or not. We have one that assumes um, no treatment, right? It sort of gives the worst case scenario. And we have another one that assumes continuous treatment. It gives the best case. All three of those, are based on a combination of 80% GBT to 20% Cubist. I mean, they're separate machine learning models, but we, we combine in the same way with the same weight space for all three. We just end up with three models, which we'll go over next. So we also developed a verification um, uh, scripts and applications for this whole system. It was really important because we needed to assess each individual machine, machine learning model, also the combination and then the different you know, types of models that we're doing. So we have um, some verification applications. You can basically give it a date and hour range. For, so for any date and hour range over several days, it will look at all of the friction forecasts produced and you can get some bulk statistics. It's a great way to look at bulk statistics to compare the models. And, and then also we have another script that basically can plot time series against observed friction values. And that's really nice to look at some cases and really see how well the models are doing um, in terms of specific cases. And so we ended up looking at a bunch of historical cases. We had all of this data from MSP as far as the observed friction values. And we used the verification scripts to sort of determine uh, where we wanted to go. And I'll show some examples that basically show the output of the system um, in terms of a time series compared to OBS and, and kind of what it represents and, this, and also show some statistics. So. Here is a first plot that shows our new model output. So again, this would be uh, for a six hour forecast. So the y, the X axis is uh, time, valid times in the future. It's really the lead time going out to six hours. The Y axis is the friction values. And so this particular forecast was generated on February 7th, 2019 at 1815 Z. So right off the bat here, the dark blue line with the points are the actual observations from MSP. The light orange line, that's our friction forecast that assumes continuous treatment. It would show you the upper bounds. The dark orange line is the friction forecast that assumes no treatment, shows you the, the, the lower bounds, the worst conditions. And then this light blue line that tracks here is the, is, the, is the friction forecast that reacts to treatments. And actually you can see that. So if you follow it along here, it's predicting fairly low values, and you can see that our low values are pretty close to the observed low values. We're in range. It tracks along here, and then we actually have a forecasted treatment from MDSS, and this coincidentally lined up in time with the treatment that was done by MSP. And so that shows you that, this, that the model is reacting. It has a recovery in the friction values, and then it comes back down, and it follows the pattern 
uh, the low, it doesn't get the low values quite as well here, but it generally gets you the pattern. And so you have a nice range of what to expect during a storm. And of course it was at the end of storm, you would see recovery um, in the forecast. So here's one more example of that. And this is another forecast. So this one is actually from February 25th, 2018, issued at 015Z. So again, the blue, dark blue line with the dots here are the actual observations from MSP. The light orange line is your forecast that assumes continuous treatment. The dark orange line is the forecast that, that assumes no treatment. And then again, we have this light blue that will react to forecasted treatments. So you can see here, the first, the, the light blue line actually does react to a forecasted treatment that's pretty well timed with when MSP did their treatment. And so you have a rise in friction values, it comes back down. The low values line up fairly well, uh, both from the, the friction forecast that takes into account treatment and the one that assumes no treatment. So we're getting the low values. We have another forecasted treatment here right in the middle. And you can see here, it was off in time by maybe 30 minutes to an hour. So, you know, that's what I'm talking about. You know, MDSS won't predict treatments exactly when MSP is treating, but you can see it react in a similar way with a rise in friction values, and then the friction values come back down. And so, you know, you can see that you, you can have a good range. I mean, especially if you look here, let's say back a little to the left, where you have, you know, well, here's my expected range. And during the heart of this event, we know we're gonna have problems where even with re recovery, we're only getting friction values either, you know, at about 0.32, which is still borderline. So just a little bit more about the, the verification script. This is an example of doing, you know, bulk statistics where you run over an entire range and you look at all of the forecasts generated in that range and you compare the different models. And in this case, we started looking at model combinations. This was for a February 9th case. I think this was from 2019. But regardless, what it's showing here is that this combination of the 80% GBT and 20% Cubis um, is better in this case than a combination where we looked at 77% gradient boosted trees and 23% neural network. So, you know, we're getting a higher hit percentage, lower miss, misses, and the MA and the RMSE is lower compared to this other model. And so we looked at a lot of cases like this. Here's another one from a January 23rd case, I think this was from 2019, same thing, much better hit percentage, lower misses, lower MAE and RMSE using this 80% GBT and 20% Cubis combination. So ultimately um, that was at the end of phase two, we just did a few things uh, to finalize the system. We fixed a bug related to generating some hourly updates. Um, so the system wouldn't stomp on itself. So if it finds friction data during a standard run, it'll wait a little bit, but then it will do forward air correction and re-output a forecast data. And if we receive any sort of friction data in, in between the hour, um, it will utilize that data and it will forward air correct and reissue the forecast. Uh, and, it'll, and the forecast will start at the latest 15 minute time and go out six hours. So it gives you a nice updated forecast with uh, the real-time friction data. And the other thing we did was we just sort of modified some of the way that the output looks in terms of the color coding in the matrix, which I'll get into slowly or, or, or after this, where basically before, if there was a, a really big uh, increase in friction values, which would indicate no closure, and we would normally make that white. But if there's a storm occurring, we make those in between uh, lead time boxes yellow just to indicate that closure is still likely. So we'll we'll, we'll take a quick look at this. Um, not too much longer here on the talk, but so this is an initial uh, runway closure matrix example. So again, this is for a six hour forecast. You can see at the top of the matrix, you have your valid times going out. This is all in local time. So this would be 330 here. You have all of your different runways. Um, down here on the x-axis or in your in your column, in the first column here. And then it shows you what the friction values are for each runway midpoint. And then we color code based on an algorithm, whether or not you know closures are possible, likely, or most likely. And you can see this is the start of an event where you know we think that runways closures are gonna be likely at least for this one runway. And you can see it deteriorating for the other runways. So here's a more updated example. This was for a, a recent storm. This was February 9th, 2020, um, issued at 4.45 in the morning. This was a pretty big snow event. 
for them. This is during the middle of, of the event, but you can see that basically you're gonna hit the heart of the event with closures likely across all of the runways during this three or four hour period between you know, about 5.45 a.m. and 8.15 a.m. on this day. Um, and then you can see that in conditions are gonna improve based on the color coding of the runway matrix. And it gives you clear indication for each runway um, midpoint or endpoint um, where the problems are gonna be. So next, I'm just gonna show some of our other output. So we also produce these weather forecast plots for MSP just as more guidance. Some of it is repeated information just viewed in a different way. So again, this is for the, the February 9th, 2020 storm. So on the left side here, this is actually the friction forecast from the three different models. You know, the one in blue is the one that reacts to the treatments and you can see it there. The one that assumes continuous treatment is in green and the one that assumes no treatment is in orange. So you see your friction forecast on the right, an indication of runway closures. It's this exact same color code that we use on the matrix, just another way to view it. We include things like temperature dew point and road temperature. Again, these are zero to six hour forecasts at 15 minute lead times. We include things like what the snow rate is, these blue bar, or the red bars here, and then the total snow accumulated during that six hours. We also, um, you know, put out a, cro a, a crosswind potential, which is really the the, the, the critical angle, the, the wind wind the component of the wind speed perpendicular to the runway that can blow planes off or prevent them from landing. In this case, there was no crosswind, but we show what the wind speed is and what the wind direction is, and we also have a plot that shows the blowing snow potential. Um, and that's, you know, based on if snow's on the ground and it's windy and whatnot. And in this case, there was no blowing snow. So this is just a quick example of um, the event getting started um, for that February 9th event. Um, and in this case, we did receive real-time friction data. So we were able to forward air correct the forecast. And now all of the models really match the observations much more closely here on the left side. I circled the forward air correction portion. And we did issue this updated forecast at 3.45 a.m. And it's the beginning of the event. And you can see the snow starting may have uh, potentially had some runway issues. It improves with some treatment, but the problems start to come back. And, and the plots, of course, the snow plot shows that the snow rates are going to increase and the total snow accumulation is going to increase. And the temperatures are holding steady. And we don't typically, in this case, have any crosswind issues or blowing snow issues. So here's the middle of the event. Again, we were receiving real-time friction data during this event. So we we're able to forward air correct and even forward air correcting, we're still in that, that range of low values, you know, below 0.3, approaching 0.2. We know there's going to be problems. So initially, we can see it's blue, which indicates closures likely. But as the snow increases, the temperatures drop. It's really an increase in snowfall. If you look at the plot below this, we are indicating that the runways are going to need to be closed. In this case, this was for 12L, 30R, and it's the northwest one-third segment. And again, there was no indication of crosswinds or blowing snow in this one. And then at the very end of the event, same thing, we're still receiving real-time friction data. So we're able to put out an update at 6.45 a.m. We're starting to get some recovery from treatment. So we forward air corrected the friction values. You can see here that there's some recovery initially. We still have some snow falling. So in between treatments, we're, we're still expecting a little bit of closure, but as time goes on here, the closures become less likely to the point of going completely away at the end of the forecast. And we know that we're probably gonna be fine in terms of friction on the runways. Now in this particular, and you can see here, the plot below, it shows that the snow accumulation is gonna end and the snow rates are gonna to fall to zero. There was no crosswinds in this case, but in this, in, but this particular time, we are predicting a little bit of blowing snow at the very end of the, of the, very end of the event. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this because this was really uh, adjacent to the runway friction, not really related. But like I said, we, we we created a blowing snow potential. And really what that's looking at is it's the age of the last snowfall, the wind speed temperatures. It's an algorithm that was developed at NCAR. We all ultimately come up with a value between zero and one. We apply some thresholds and we come up with an alert level. So low, medium, and high. And we produce that output. Same thing with the crosswind. This is just a diagram that shows the crosswind. Um, again, it's that critical angle. Um, typically perpendicular at, you know, 60 degrees perpendicular uh, to the runway. Um, and that's, you know, crosswinds are critical for planes taking off and landing and not crashing. And so we create a crosswind uh, warning. And that just, just gets into the fact that we create a crosswind speed, we apply thresholds to it. And then again, we put out an alert level, you know, zero being none, one is some crosswinds, these crosswinds are likely, and three is a crosswind warning and the runway likes it needs to be closed. So that's all output. And then ultimately, 
in the very end here, um, in, in, in March and April, we had a little bit of money and, you know, MSP was having trouble viewing all of our output products. And so we developed a, a nifty sort of simple little display viewer for the RSCPS. Like I said, it's both desktop compatible and phone compatible. It renders automatically um, and you can easily see it starts by showing you the runway closure matrix. And then below that, you can either use a carousel feature to scroll through the plots or if it's on your phone, you just scroll down with your finger. And, and it always will show the updated forecast, including the ones that are generated via F, uh, forward air correction. So here's the web page. It, it is currently password protected. Um, as long as Josh is okay, I think anybody in this group could potentially look at it and I, I can send the credentials. Um, again, it's not public. You know, this is for MSP. Um, Josh will ultimately have the ultimate say on this, but it's a nifty, very nifty way to view the closure guidance um, in a quick and easy way. So um, we're hoping that MSP can use that this winter. And lastly, my very last slide basically is, you know, we were getting ready in April, um, March or April to do a phase three, to set up a phase three with MSP. And of course, due to COVID um, and obviously a lot of airports um, having a big hit to their funding, that's on hold. We're really hoping to do a phase three with MSP at some point soon. But some of the things that we had talked about there was, we want to extend the forecast window out to 72 hours. We have output from MBSS out to 72 hours. Of course, the farther out in time, the more forecast error that you have. So that, you know, that would produce more uncertainty in the friction and the closure prediction. But there's no reason you couldn't do that, at least give it, get an idea of what's coming. And we ultimately want to port the entire system to the cloud, install it on an Amazon cloud instance. And that will allow for better uptime and easier to expand to other states in terms of space and memory. And ultimately, too, in phase three, as far as the research work, we want to utilize real-time runway treatment data. Similar to the way that we get the real-time friction data, we'd want to get real-time runway treatment data, and then we could use that to actually change and modify the treatments coming out of MDSS to better line up with the treatments from MSP. And this would clearly make the friction you know, forecast more accurate, reflecting the correct up and down in values due to treatment. So that is basically what I have. And so I will stop sharing now and take any questions. All right, thanks, Seth. Uh, um, looks like uh, Gordy uh, and Josh have had an exchange here, I guess just for the edification of the rest of the group. Gordy was asking our runway friction values used post plowing and treatment CFME devices have misleading values when run on contaminated surfaces, confusing drag and friction. And Josh, um, you responded that SFT day is not used if the snow is greater than one inch uh, deep, or you have greater than one inch, one eighth of an inch of slush on the runway. Rare they get to that point before treating the surface. Uh, might be an issue at some smaller airports. So. Uh, Gordy then uh, responded with, have you considered adding pilot reports to the friction data? And I did not see a response to that. So um, I assume that was aimed back at you, Josh. So if you want to respond to that. Sure. Um, yeah, essentially, uh, um, if that was automated, that information was able to get plugged in automatically, you know, that would be something we'd consider, um, you know, the more data the the better as far as rounding out the tool but right now that would be manual entry and and we're just not able to to, to commit to being able to do that sort of entry seth i don't know if you have anything particular to say about pilot reports you know they're not uh not very granular um but uh, potentially could augment uh, the tool in some way yeah i'll I'll, uh, I'll chime in a little bit there just like josh said i mean as far as we're concerned we're always looking for more and better data and you know i realize that all of the friction testing data may not be accurate, as uh, some other people had mentioned. But yeah, I mean, in terms of that first talk, that was quite interesting to me because I feel like, you know, the breaking um, information from the PIREPS reports, um, that's directly related to the runway friction. So it would be great in the future to be able to get, um, you know, the breaking information uh, upon landing and taking off. That could be important. Josh and I had talked about using, you know, things like MARWIS, and mobile data sensors um, or even static sensors that look down on the runway. We are always open to using um, more data and typically the best available data. 
All righty. And, and I apologize, Josh, it looks like you did partially respond there. So um, it was further down the scroll here, but uh, you did also respond. Matthias had a, a question uh, to what extent have operators looked at the output in real time? And what was their feedback in terms of utility? And uh, you responded back to him to this point, it's not been possible during an event, primarily due to workload of the staff. So I uh, didn't know if there was anything else you wanted to uh, add to that uh, from uh, Matthias there, uh, Josh? Uh, no, just uh, a lot of the technical issues with displaying the data for us has been smoothed out as, as Seth talked about with with their uh, development of the of the web based site for us to view it. So really going into this this coming season, I feel like we'll have a lot better chance to uh, to be able to monitor that while we're going about our regular uh, traditional duties. So hope, hoping and looking forward to doing that this coming year. Great. Yeah, and I'll just add, uh, just like Josh had said, the web display should be great for viewing all this data. It's going to be much easier, you know. Not and like he said, they weren't able to use it operationally um, just because of uh, there was a bar to clear to get the the plots in front of them. But I will say that I was out there last December, December 2018. They had two small snow events, and it was fun to be able to pull up the system with John and Josh. But I was looking at it intently with John, and to see the system, like they'd go out and do a run. And come back and report the values in the system. I mean, I think there was a one point it was like, oh, we just got it snowing. We got a report of 0.25. And then we looked at the forecast and was like, our system's showing about 0.225 or 0.22. So he was pretty impressed with that. Um, you know, we obviously want to get a lot of feedback, but uh, we feel like it's at least going to be useful for making some decisions. All right. And there was also a uh, exchange with. Uh, Mark Faniff asked an uh, interesting question. Are the outputs ever correlated with the Talpin numbers? And it looks like you said, Josh, not really. Uh, but the RCAM numbers during a storm are usually five, sometimes at three uh, during heavy events. Um, and then there was also a comment from uh, Jonathan Luffler that the data will be used at the artsy. Uh, or will the data be used at the RC or TRACON? Might be helpful discussion when uh, setting the AR. And um, looks like not putting words in your mouth, but I guess I am here. Uh, our goal is to eventually make this a common situational awareness tool with ATC um, to look at the same plan. Um, and I believe that was the end up. So, anything you want to add to those last couple of comments or? exchanges you had or anything else from uh, you, Seth? And I see no new comments or questions coming in, so I'll just uh, send it back over to uh, to you, Josh, as the uh, session lead there. All right, thank you, David. And uh, Seth, appreciate that, great job. I think uh, we've pretty much covered it and timing looks pretty decent. Matt, looks like you're Ready to take it from me? Well, I I I I feel compelled to make a comment, which is almost always the case. And um, um, I, I the the technical work that that has been done by the folks at NCAR and and the folks at the at the the, the Minneapolis airports is is um, is is of the highest caliber and is really interesting to follow, but. I was struck by um, how at the at the very end of the process uh, with the with the clearly superior project planning that was done by the folks out at NCAR, they had just enough money left to build a website, which in fact, in fact, made something that was just maybe barely usable because of all of the entries and whatnot that you guys had to make made it. Or, or looks like it is going to make it uh, much, much easier to do. And that's so important for those of us on the research side to remember that we, we may have the most brilliant uh, algorithm here that, that calculates all this neat stuff, but if at the end of the day, the decision makers can't execute it against it easily, then in, in many ways, it's all for naught. So bully for you, Seth and Josh, for having enough money left over to uh, to build that website. And I, I suspect that that not only will... Um, the Tracon and the Tower and Delta and all the other users at, at Mini um, be be very, very uh, desirous of seeing that information, but so will a lot of other people to see 
how it goes and how it may be applicable to their locations too. Yep, we're really looking forward to, to digging in and be able to, to use it in the day-to-day the -day operation. So excited. And, and since my daughter lives just south of the airport, I know she's not ex as excited about your use of this tool as maybe you are, but I get that. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, uh, Matt. I, I just wanted to say I agree. And um, we had several discussions at NCAR with my management and scientific leads, and it was exactly like you said. We wanted MSP to use this product. And, you know, I, we basically decided, like, we should try to put something together, if at all possible. So I appreciate that feedback because that's exactly where we're coming from. We could do all the best research in the world, but we really, especially for me, my group, we want something that's very usable and that's easy to understand and easy to pull up. And so I think with this web display, you know, the hope is, and Josh knows, you can pull this up on your phone. And so, like I said, you know, it, it'll be up to Josh. He can disseminate. But we'd be happy to share this product with the username and the password. Um, with those that are on this meeting and i can work with josh on that but thank you for your feedback i really appreciate that matt and just one final comment we've told seth from the start that we we don't want to build the, an, an msp product we want to help design this but hopefully be able to roll it out to anyone any other airport that would would like to use it and can benefit from it i mean the last thing i'll say to that point exactly right josh um you know we want to expand this and like i said the way it was initially designed it's with observations related to friction measurement. So even out of the box, this can be used um, in a lot of areas that receive snowfall. But I will tell you that I'm happy to report that, you know, we're working with DIA on a new contract for 2022 to 2024. And part of that is, is setting up a friction prediction system for them and utilizing their data to expand upon this work. So we're, we're on our way to doing that if that goes through. Thank you. Very good. Matthias, are you still with us? I haven't heard you in hours. Yes, I've been listening intently. <laughs> well, we are we are right on. I mean, based on my wall clock here, we are right on the money. Very good job, Josh, and and bringing this thing home uh, right on time. Um, do you want to do you want to take a few minutes and let maybe. Uh, let Tim et al. get organized, or or maybe we should bring Tim Miner in here now and ask him how he wants to proceed. Well, operators are standing by to present, and really at the, uh, this is not going to take terribly long because this isn't really a presentation to the recipients. This is an announcement of sometime we will present, <laughs> but it's the first public announcement of, uh, of the um, of the this, so this really isn't going to take very long at all. And I think uh, if everybody uh, can um, handle uh, just uh, two or three more minutes, um, I will be done and give it back to you for the day. How about that? Sounds like a plan to me. All right. Well, let me see if I can. Uh, uh, can I take over screen share and uh, show a couple of slides? Is that possible? Absolutely. You know how to do it. I think so. Let's see here what I got. And uh, let's see, I'm showing you. Let's yeah. open the share tray. <sighs> Heavy sigh. <laughs> Marvelous technology, isn't it? Yes. One would think that I should be able to do this, and I can see what I'm doing. All right. I'm assuming that no, maybe not. I'm assuming you can't see it then, huh? Uh, at this point, no. So Tim, you want you, all you want to do is hover your your mouse over the display. You'll see a, that that tray in the bottom. You see open share tray. You yeah. click on open share tray, and then there'll be a a series of choices that Teams has has found on your uh, your computer, and you just select which of those by clicking on it, and that should cause the share to start. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't show my PowerPoint program, which is open in the background, and that's my, that's my concern. So, uh, done this before in other teams, but uh, okay. right now, not showing showing it. And I've heard that uh, other speakers were having issues as well. So, yeah, you won't be the first, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, another thing you could do if you want, Tim, is uh, is share your desktop and then uh, and then possibly bring your uh, your PowerPoint over to that monitor or that portion of your desktop. All right. Well, let me see what I can do. Your entire screen, your application. 
Or you could send the PowerPoint to Matt and Matt can do it. <laughs> we can do it that way too. Or I could just actually talk about it. I suppose I can do that too. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Let me try something here. There I am. Bingo. We got down. Now let's see what else we can do here. That's you. Yeah. Now I'm still showing the desktop window, which is actually you. So it's only showing the teams and not my PowerPoint presentation. So, all right, well, then let me just uh, um, get in here and I'll just uh, chat a little bit about what's going on here. And uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about the Aviation and Sp Space Operations Weather Prize 20 for 2020. Uh, this is uh, put together by a consortium of uh, eight different organizations. Uh, originally, uh, we were on our fourth uh, uh, iteration, and our goal was to, as weather users, reward the weather science community and for outstanding efforts and uh, in basically providing safety and in providing efficiency, which are the two really big key components to uh, aviation meteorology and space operations uh, meteorology as well. Our eight organizations, and this really is a complete team effort, uh, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, the Airline Dispatchers Federation, uh, the Airline Pilots Association, Airlines for America's Meteorology Committee, the Allied Pilots Association, the National Business, I'm sorry, the National Air Traffic Controllers Association, the National Business Aviation Association, and the Range Commanders Council's uh, Meteorology Committee. Uh, uh, what I was going to show you is a picture of, uh, we wanted to make this the biggest prize in aviation weather, and it truly is the biggest prize, literally in, in size. Uh, it is a, a, a very nicely uh, engra engraved plaque with all these different organization logos. Um, in terms of recipients, uh, we began with Dr. John McCarthy for his work in uh, microbursts and the uh, the practical applications of microburst studies to aviation, saving an awful lot of lives uh, uh, by not only uh, developing the techniques that um, pilots use to escape from microburst encounters, but uh, how we go about uh, uh, providing the warnings for it. The second year, uh, we actually uh, rewarded the FPAW effort itself as part of uh, this, uh, uh, this prize. And we also uh, recognize Dr. Robert uh, uh, Shermer uh, for his work in the EDR for turbulence. Uh, last year, uh, for the first time, we actually uh, showed up at, uh, at the FPAW meeting in Washington, DC. And uh, Jim Evans, and uh, we were just uh, Dr. Evans from MIT, uh, Lincoln Laboratory and his work and in uh, uh, technologies that, uh, again, uh, help us with uh, convective weather and uh, those hazards. And for the first time, we actually created a service award, um, which was uh, uh, given out to uh, Mr. Rick Hewinkle, retired of the FAA. And, and so with that model in mind, just announcing our two recipients, there will be one recipient of the Aviation and Space Operations Weather Prize, and we will announce also a uh, service award as well. And the Aviation and uh, Operations Weather Prize for 2020 uh, rather fortuitously goes again for uh, winter operations. Uh, I was about to show a display of a, of a PowerPoint presentation that was given at the October 2010 FPAW meeting. And uh, it was about the update on liquid uh, water equivalent efforts the A4A Met Committee nominated uh, Dr. Roy Rasmussen for this award, and uh, he is going to be the recipient of the of the prize for 2020 uh, for his work in uh, liquid water, uh, water equivalent, uh, which has been instrumental in helping aviation come to grips with uh, uh, de-icing and come to grips with winter weather operations in the terminal area, and so. For that uh, work in uh, efficiency, uh, again, Dr. Roy Rasmussen will will be re be receiving the, the 2020 prize when we can meet in person. 
and that brings us to a service award and uh, AOPA uh, nominated and was accepted. Uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Thomas Horn for his uh, outstanding efforts in educating aviation pilots uh, in uh, general aviation uh, to weather hazards uh, and important work in aviation sa uh, safety as well. So that's uh, our announcement for today. And uh, again, it's been uh, uh, my privilege to represent uh, this group of outstanding uh, uh, aviation professionals uh, from throughout the entire industry. Uh, it's our privilege to, uh, to thank each and every one of you involved in aviation weather for each and every, all of your individual contributions. It's really, really difficult to pick uh, one recipient every, every year. And um, uh, again, a, a hard choice, but we look forward to uh, continuing this work into the future. Well, that's all I have. And uh, thank you so much for the chance to, uh, to make that presentation. So um, I'll give the uh, microphone back to, uh, and the gavel back to your, your team, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. That, that's great. And uh, two very well, well deserving uh, individuals that you identified. Um, Matthias, I, I, I don't know if you've been following the email thread that's, that's been going on on the side, but, um, but uh, Tom Haynes from AOPA, who is uh, their, their vice president of, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten it up, Tom, and say Corpcom for the moment, um, uh, is, is on the call. And, and uh, I, I don't see, while well, I don't see Tom Horn here, I do see Tom Haynes. And I wonder, Tom Haynes, if you have maybe any, any, uh, any comments that you'd like to make. Well, sure. We also have Tom George just around at the Tom's uh, on the call. Yeah. <laughs> also from the OPA. But yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we will make sure that, that Tom Horn uh, get, gets the word and we'll promote it out through our uh, media channels as well to make sure that that recognition uh, that you folks have bestowed upon Tom is, and, and the other recipient are, are, are well documented. Uh, and, I, and I'm really grateful that you recognize Tom. I mean, he's been writing the Weather Watch column uh, for AOPA pilot for 30 some years and it's you know it's the world's largest aviation publication he has educated you know you know millions of pilots uh, millions of, uh, of folks have read his work and uh, also he's written the, literally wrote the book on aviation weather uh, dealing uh, uh, called flying america's weather and so he broke the country down into regions and talked about the different weather phenomena that occur and how it impacts pilots so uh, you all do a great job of figuring out uh, the great weather products and, and how to use the weather products. And uh, he's, he's done a great job of telling pilots how to access and use the weather tools that are out there as well. And also very involved in sort of the cutting edge weather products that are continually showing up on the, on the NOAA and NWS weather uh, uh, sites as well. So anyhow, thank you all for the recognition and we'll make sure that Tom knows about it. See, you know, I, I, I said in an email the other day, I do this about 43 times a week. You see my <laughs> lips moving and nothing's coming out. And, li and like Dave, I, I talk louder and louder to my laptop and nothing happens. Uh, but Matthias, uh, Roy is, uh, Roy is in, uh, in your organization, is he not, or in NCAR? Yes. Do you have any, uh, any remarks about... Uh, about Roy's selection, which which I I, I think is a uh, I think is a, a wonderful one. Although if I'm a betting person for next year, I, I I gotta come up with an NCAR candidate because right now NCAR is romping in the industry weather prize arena. Well, I'm sure Roy uh, is tickled about receiving this recognition because I know he spent quite a bit of effort in, in the liquid water equivalent and trying to come up with a good way of capturing this and, and helping the aviation industry uh, to make progress in that area. So I don't know, Tim, if he is actually aware of this already or not, uh, but I would be happy to communicate that to him. Well, you're going to have to, and actually, I've been trying to reach him for quite some time uh, uh, over the last few days, and haven't been able to do it. So, uh, I'm going to have to let you handle that uh, that as well. And uh, uh, it would have, of course, been nice to meet you uh, 
meet together in person out there where he is already. Uh, but um, since that couldn't happen, uh, we'll pick another time uh, to gather together and we'll make sure that, uh, that the pictures are there. And uh, again, thank him for all of us for his outstanding work. He really was a very strong candidate and really uh, the airline industry really, really, really appreciates all that he did to, to really bring that efficiency in weather, uh, winter operations to us. Thank you. Sure. And let's hope we can have meetings in person again. Matt, do you want to unmute yourself again? You see, I'm so good about muting. It's the unmuting. I just, I just never remember. <laughs> I think we've ticked all the boxes off in our agenda, and um, and um, uh, can either give folks 15 minutes of their life back, or we could circle back out to the audience and and ask if. Uh, uh, perhaps if, if anybody has any any further comments or questions that 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 we should entertain in our remaining few minutes. Andy did not that he's keeping track, but he did answer uh, you that it's 44 times this week now for your meeting. <laughs> you know that 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 dude is is he he watches you like a hawk and he counts all those times and marks them all down on his piece of paper. <laughs> I know I've had to sit up much straighter since I started working with him. <laughs> so well, I don't see any more comments coming in, Matt. So uh, I, I think that um, maybe uh, people are figuring it's it's uh, t time to to leave the last word with you and Matthias there. Yeah, it sounds like people are. Uh, oh, there's Bruce. Hang on a second. Bruce has something to say. So I just wanted to. Um, say that I, th I think uh, Matthias and, and Matt and, and Rhonda, you guys have done a really excellent job of adapting the uh, FPA format to to continue on during this uh, this pandemic. And I really uh, appreciate how, how well this uh, worked today. Uh, really good job. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Interestingly, Bruce, uh, as I'm sure you are aware, there have been a number of um, of, of of methods or or um, strategies employed, you know, to to do this kind of thing virtually. And I, I, you know, I I I I don't think it's because of any, you know, in Matthias's case, it, it probably is because of innate brilliance. I know in my case, it's not because of innate brilliance, but we 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 settled on a formula that works pretty well i think for us and and i know we tried to sell some other organizations which shall go uh, unnamed at this point in time uh, about the efficacy of 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 this uh, way of doing business and uh, um they they're they're not believing us so we'll see maybe their way will work well too we'll see but uh, i think i think this is this has been a nice way to do things well, you had, um, you know, upwards of 90 people uh, logged on today, uh, and it it came out to be uh, nice, smooth, you know, very few hiccups. So, uh, it, really useful. Thanks a bunch. It's also, it's not just a matter of how we set it up and how we try to shepherd it. It's also a matter of how well the attendees behave, muting the microphones <laughs> and participating in it in a way, you know, that makes it possible. Yeah. Yeah. So so if I I do have a hat, but it's not within reach, but but pretend I have a hat. Um, I'm, I'm tipping to the 90 some people who have been on. Thank you for for being good sports. Thank you for using the chat room to do all your the majority of your questioning for those that answered. Uh, there, the folks' questions on the chat. Thank you for for doing that and and saving us the uh, the time on the backside to do so. That was very much appreciated. Um, and um, and uh, again, it, it it seems to work well. Now we we did it for one day, but for a longer period of time in the spring. Now we're doing three days at four hours apiece. I have a feeling by Thursday then I'm not going to know how to unmute the phone. So I'll just be sitting there with my lips moving the whole time and no sound coming out. <laughs> Anyhow. All right, Matthias. Um, 
shall we uh, shall we declare Monday a victory and uh, I mean Tuesday a victory and uh, and look forward to Wednesday? Yes, uh, we shall resume tomorrow morning at eleven o'clock Eastern time with day two of the Friends and Partners meeting. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you all. See you tomorrow. Have a good day, guys. Thanks. See you yeah. tomorrow. It was great.